stuff. And so I understand that there is a real, it, it's really, really easy to do the go along, to get along thing and to just kind of hold your nose, re, reject where your your where your mind and where the spirit of God is leading you and just uphold the tradition that you're in, right? I, and I just never, I've never been that way. And sometimes I wish I was because usually, to, you know, just it gets me in trouble. Um, just trying yeah, no, to I... where the spirit of God leads. Yeah. Righty, brother Scott, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, man. And uh, let's just go ahead and start right away, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to give an introduction for yourself. I'm sure some of the people uh, that will watch this might have heard of you, but there will be others, of course, that have not. Do you mind uh, just beginning with just giving an introduction of who is Scott Clem? Right? Is that pronounced your last name yeah, properly? Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. This is this is fun. Um, always a privilege to do stuff like this. So. I'm Scott Clem, uh, married uh, for what, going on 20 years, and uh, we have five kids. Our oldest is a senior in high school, 17 years old, and our youngest is about a year and five months, um, and so we've got, a, we've got a busy household. It's fun. Um, you, you wouldn't know it based on the video, but, but I'm actually paralyzed from the waist down, so January 2004. I was in a skiing accident and had something called a burst fracture. So it kind of blew up my spine, uh, bruised my spinal cord, and the rest is history, as they say. So I can kind of hobble around on arm crutches and things like that. Um, but most of the time, the wheelchair is my my main mobility. Um, diverse background. I, um, you know, due to my accident, I had to, I wasn't, um, you know, kind of have, took a hiatus, I guess you could say, as far as any kind of college or anything like that. And, um, you know, met my wife about eight months after my accident. We were, we got married like nine months later. And then almost a year later, we had our first kid. And so um, I decided I was going to go back to work, kind of put college and things like that on hold. Um, long story short, I was in the social service field, I guess you could say, um, and was in charge of running a, a residential group home for, for unruly teenagers. And, um, and then during that time as well, I, uh, I got crazy and I ran for a local office an elected office. And so I became a state representative in the Wyoming legislature and, uh, did that for about six years. And then, um, you know, throughout all of this time, I, I felt I mean, I knew I was called to preach and so kind of went more of a non-traditional route, um, was ordained through my local church. And uh, and so I really kind of um, I, I I did not run again for the elected office that I held because um, I really wanted to focus more on on the ministry aspect of things. And so uh, I ended up becoming the pastor of the church that my wife and I went to for for, you know, was it 17 years or so? And um, about three years ago, I ended up resigning from that position. Um, and and so right now we're doing kind of a, a smaller work, I guess you could say, as far as a house church that we're doing right now. Um, I decided I was going to go back to school because I've, it seems like things have always kind of interrupted um, any kind of higher education. And so I thought, well, I should probably really do that. And, and have something as far as a, a stupid piece of paper that people say that you need to have. Um, and it's, honestly, it's pretty much the only reason I'm doing it is so that I have a piece of paper because I really don't feel that I necessarily need it. Um, but you do if you want to if you want to if you want to get into some positions, I guess. And so uh, it's going back to school doing that. And uh, and yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. Okay, well, you spawned a couple of questions. So, number one, we can relate because we both had the pastorship position. And number two, I have a busy household as well. So I have seven kids, and they're very similar in age. I have a daughter that's getting ready to turn wow. 16, and I also have uh, right around a one-year-old. So very, very similar household. You have seven in your house in total. I have nine in mine, so they're both very busy. And yeah. we both pastor. That's right. Yeah. So um, yeah. the other thing that I was, uh, was going to ask you about— 
um, was, so you said that you're, right now you're going to college, right? You're going to Correct. school online? Mm -hmm. where, where are you mm -hmm. attending? If you don't mind sharing, I don't know if you... Oh no, not not at all. Liberty University. I'm 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 kind feeling. of taking the path of yeah, taking the path of of least resistance. Not that I don't think Liberty is a you know um, a bad school or you know it's it's not a paper mill or anything like that. Right, right. Um, you know, there's some le legitimacy to it. But um, you know what I what I wanted to do um, throughout the years, just kind of reevaluated things. Um, certainly, pastoring is, is something that I I love to do, but I. If you know, I would love to be in um, an academic setting, not so much maybe you know high school or anything like that, but um, but even kind of a college setting, teaching or something like that. And so, my um, you know, my goal is to try to do the Masters of Divinity thing. And um, yeah, so so I'm attending. Goes. I asked because that's that's right now. That's I've talked to a lot of people that are attending online that are from maybe a similar background does independent Baptist. Mm -hmm. I also am online Liberty university. So that oh. I had a feeling. Yeah. So similar. Yeah. yeah it's, there it's, you go. I just keep stacking up here. Okay. There hey, you so, go. That's uh, right. Let's talk about another similarities. Something that really, um, um, brother McMurtry, I'll name drop him. I had talked to him a little bit over the past six months or so. And I know that he's been studying eschatology and prophecy. And about three years ago, you did an interview with him, not necessarily an interview, but a discussion, a roundtable discussion, we'll call it. And uh, you guys, it was uh, Pastor Matt first. It was you at the time. I assume you were pastoring at that time, about the time Correct. you were still at that church. And then, um, and then Pastor McMurtry. And you guys talked about Daniel's 70th week. And I, at that time, held very similar beliefs. Um, and that's not extremely common today, especially in the setting of independent Baptists. Now, I've publicly mm -hmm. uh, preached through a series, and um, I have uh, publicly, you know, come out with my position as post millennial. And you, interestingly, when I was speaking to Brother McMurtry, he had told me that you had transitioned over to a similar position, uh, like kind of you said a, a blend between an ah mill and a post mill position at this point. So right. mm -hmm. I, because we came from similar backgrounds to begin with, independent Baptist, um, both of us for quite a while were, um, you know, a, a flavor or some sort of taste of covenant theology, but also at the very same time we were post-trib, pre-wrath at, at that point, futurist. So it's, mm -hmm. it's very interesting, the pathway, and I thought that this would be perfect to have another person on that could relate to kind of the same transition that I went through. And I would like to know the sticking points and how this transition took place, and I kind of threw that out there to you. So if you don't mind, let's begin yeah. with I think it makes the most sense. You Were you ever actually dispensational? I guess i got to ask you that first. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty much um, – you know, I was 19 years old when I was, when I was injured. And, and I was saved. I, I had trusted the Lord be, uh, prior to that, but, um, but that really, that really got me serious about my, my walk with the Lord. And, um, and that's really when I started to become faithful in my, my own adult life to church. And so I went to, I went to a church that my grandma recommended, uh, grandma would recommend an independent fundamental Bible believing Baptist church. And it's all right. That sounds so like I a found grandma. One. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. And so I found one and, uh, the, the pastor there, great, great man of God. He, uh, God, he's gone to be with the Lord now, uh, but he was really my first, first pastor and he was dispensational. Uh, and he was probably more of the, the classic dispensational type. Um, I can, I can recall that, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't spend a lot of time in eschatology, but of course you touch on it when you're in the ministry. And, and I can recall one message in particular that it really just was a head scratcher to me. Uh, had to do with the the, uh, the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. And so classic dispensationalists, they, they split that up. You know, the kingdom of heaven is one thing. The kingdom of God is something else. They're distinct. They're separate. And uh, and so, you know, that played in his eschatology to where, you know, he believed that Christians, um, say, say Gentiles anyway, uh, would would spend, I don't know, eternity or some length of time anyway up in heaven. Um, while the, the Jews got to spend their time on, on earth and there was the split. And so he, he worked all that stuff out. All that to say that, um, well, I didn't necessarily agree with that 
um, I was pretty well sold on dispensational theology. And, and that's really what I was ordained under as well. Um, you know, knowing all the ins and outs. Um, where that really began to change for me is, is actually a, a summer camp. Um, it was a, a camp that, that uh, the church that I pastored had, had gone to, as well as Matt first. That's how I was introduced to Matt. And, uh, and Matt and I were, were in the same cabin the first year that I became a camp counselor. And we just had a ton of fun. I mean, it was he was just thoroughly enjoyable. Great man of God, um, serious, loves the Lord. Um, you know, just I, I can't I can't speak highly of him enough. And and I came to realize more after the fact that that Matt did not believe in a future seven year tribulation. And granted, at that time, like uh, it, that was that was kind of a shocker to me to to and, and I found out he was not pre-trib as well. And for me, I was such I was in such a mindset to where if a person wasn't pre-trib, like I questioned their salvation. Like, how, how can you be right. saved? How can you be right with God if you're not pre-trib? Like something is seriously wrong. But and, and so there was a conflict. There was there was definitely some tension going on within me because I, I look at this guy and I thought, well, um, you know, he preaches right as far as I know and everything else, solid on salvation and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, how can he be so off in this one area? And so he and I, um, he and I would would um, communicate back and forth. It was like through Facebook Messenger or something like that. And this is years and years ago. And um, and I kind of I began to challenge him a little bit. Other things happened to where the camp actually kicked him out of the camp because of his position on on uh, on the tribulation and on Israel and things like that. That didn't sit well with me, um, but. Um, you know, all, all, all that to say, I wanted to communicate with him and I was kind of um, arrogant, I guess you could say, arrogant, cocky. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to learn this guy's position so, so that I can prove him wrong. I'm going to I'm going to show him in the Bible where he's off. Right. Just what a what a conceited guy. <laughs> and um, and so the more he and I communicated, the more like I knew I wasn't getting through to him. And in the meantime, I was being challenged on some things that were making me think. And, and all that to say, for a period of, I don't know, it's like two or three years. I mean, it wasn't like this constant thing where I was always thinking about it and studying it out. But but for a period of about three years, I really kind of struggled with this. And, um, you know, it was uh, it was really my first year into the pastorate. I had some I had some real questions about the pre-trib rapture. I couldn't I couldn't you know, justify it from scripture. And, um, and so then I, I, you know, I kind of revisited the whole 70 weeks thing. And the more and more I looked at that, um, I really just became convinced through my own study and, and through, um, you know, just some prodding and patience from, from another friend, another man of God to, to um, it really helped me arrive at the position, position that I arrived in. And that became, even more solidified. I actually, um, I preached a message or a, a series of messages through, through Daniel. I kind of thought I knew where I was going to go with it, but, but even then as, as I was studying that book out and studying those passages, um, reading different materials, um, I really enjoyed, um, some of the works from, uh, Philip Morrow. Philip Morrow has got a, he's got a, a book entitled the, the 70 weeks in the great tribulation, Philip Morrow, what he's kind of gone through the same kind of path, right? I, I think at one time he was dibbling or dabbling maybe in dispensationalism. I can't quite remember, but I know he went the historic pre-mill route. And then and then ultimately he ended up going to, I think, a mill, and I think he stayed there. Um, but in any event, um, you know, his his writing certainly helped me to look at things a, a different way. And as I was studying those things out, it just became more and more convinced not only of i guess you could say a a post-trib rapture if you want to say that um I, you know for me it just, it just made sense the second coming is when the the, the resurrection takes place the resurre resurrection slash rapture all takes place at the same time but it was mm -hmm. through that as well that i really began to i began to um really see the 70 weeks as as messianic and not eschatological 70 weeks or messianic meaning that it all took place in the past 
Right. And so I, I was convinced that, that the entire 70 weeks took place in the past, that it was it was a prophecy to lead up to Christ. It was about the person and work of Christ. Um, and, it, and in fact, it has been brought to pass. But again, that, you know, and so all of this kind of stuff, you know, you 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 change on that one. I, I called that one in particular, the whole 70 weeks issue is really kind of a linchpin for um, for me, I think, when it when it came to, to end time stuff, because everything about the futurist view really is um you know it's built upon this idea that there is a future 70 weeks a 70 week uh, or seven 70th week um Mm -hmm. and so if you take that away like well then okay okay well well, what do you do and then so you're trying to make sense of revelation there's periods of three and a half years and all that kind of stuff but there isn't a particular seven year period and so, so for me, I was, I was, you know, working through all of that different stuff, but I was convinced anyway, of the, the fact that the 70th, you know, 70 weeks prophecy that was messianic, it was fulfilled in the past. And then at, by the end of that Daniel study, I came away and it was actually about the time that I did that, um, that I did that, um, round table, those discussions with, with brother McMurtry and, and, and brother first, um, and it's in one of those videos. I actually even um, I mirrored my screen because I created like this chart, and I, I don't even know if I fully grasped what I was um, what what I had kind of charted out. Although I felt it was biblical, and that is that that we have been in in some sense in tribulation, you know, ever since the days of Christ. In other words, the tribulation period isn't isn't some you know future um seven years but um but as jesus said in this world you'll have tribulation you know uh, be of good cheer i've overcome the world and so i i began to view really from the from the time of christ um all the way up until today as a quote-unquote period of tribulation um and, there, and of course there's all much other things so so that's just it kind of in a broad you know some broad strokes as far as you know how i arrived at the position um, or started to arrive at the position that I that I'm at today, you know, in in the midst of all of that, you know, there's other things that you have to gra- grapple with. Mm-hmm. One of them is the kingdom of God, and um, right. and that was another thing. As a dispensationalist, I was I was sold on the idea that you know Jesus came in the first century to offer the kingdom to the Jews, and the Jews rejected it. Therefore, he you know, he hit the pause button. The The kingdom of God has been postponed. It's been put in abeyance. And now we're in this parenthetical period called the, you know, the church age. And then one of these days when Jesus returns, he's going to offer the kingdom once again to Israel. And that's what a future millennium essentially consists of is this, 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 um, this kingdom period where, where the, the Jews finally accept the kingdom. Right. Right. And so, um, so I struggled with that as well with, with all of this because I it, it was clear to me, you know, just reading the gospels that you know if there if there is a theme, if there is a concept that really kind of takes center stage throughout the throughout the gospels, it's the kingdom of God. Absolutely. Like, and 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 to you know, just to you know, push that off and say, well, you know, Jesus postponed that. It's in a band or something like that. It right. just didn't sit well with me. And so um you know, another guy that I, I started to to read um, just to I, I was looking for I was, you know, in, in the independent fundamental Baptist world. Right. Where I was grappling with all this stuff. Well, first of all, like there's no one else like you, like you, you and I are anomalies. Right, right. Um, Brother McMurtry, Pastor First, anomalies like. Right. And, and they're not where, where, you know, where we're at. Even as a, um, even as a futurist, that was the point that I was going to make, right. you know, uh, j- uh, you know, right. to protect them a little bit too, but nonetheless, but even as a futurist mm-hmm. and a post trip pre wrath you're still, you know, not welcome. What's happened in, and maybe we'll get into this a little bit. You kind of alluded to it um, uh, earlier in, in the independent fundamental Baptist movement, what started off as standing for the, le- you know, the legitimate fundamentals of the faith, like the virgin birth, you know, the deity of Christ, right? The the orthodox view of the Trinity, these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. What started off to def- they were defending that in the fundamentalist movement. There were Presbyterians that were a part of it, Baptists that were a part of it, against the this surge of liberalism 
and if you're familiar with, and I'm sure you are, but if the listener is familiar with what was happening in our culture and society at that time with, you know, Darwinism and just this, this you know, huge wave of liberalism that was coming in and secularism and how the Enlightenment kind of just, you know, all of this was, was coming at the same time. That was what the fundamentalist movement was about then. But now exactly. today, a hundred years later, it's, you know, um, everything is a fundamental to the fundamentalists. And right. uh, truly, and, and, you know, it's funny because truly, um, if everything is a fundamental, then nothing is a fundamental, right? Yeah. Bingo. At that point, yeah. And and th there's their issue. It's where even if you hold a different view in something like eschatology, that's where we've gotten now. Even even to mm -hmm. the point of still being a futurist, but you think, you know, there's there's another three and a half years that need to take place before the rapture. That. That's the deciding factor. You know, the three and a half years is the deciding yeah. factor on your salvation, which is absurd. It is. And it, and that's the kind of stuff, you know, that I, I was, I mean, I was dealing with some of that stuff as well. Um, I mentioned the same, the same camp that um, the pastor first and I had, had gone to. Well, I, I all of a sudden, um, due to, you know, some of the videos that I, that I did with Matt and, um, and, and brother McMurtry, um, all of a sudden now I'm finding myself on the outs with some of these people. And, um, and so there was an effort to remove, remove me, remove our church from, from the camp. And it, some of this stuff just got ugly. And, and again, it goes back to this whole idea of, you know, what, what really is a fundamental, like what, right. what are, what are the main and plain things of scripture and what are the things that we can disagree about? Right, is exactly. is the is the rapture a pre-trib rapture is that the hill that we're going to die on is that the make or break thing right and um and so yeah all of that has been blown completely completely out of proportion and as you mentioned i think there's um you know we're so far removed from the real battles that were taking place in the early 20th century as far as combating this this liberalism as as you uh, rightly expressed and how how the enlightenment factored into how people were viewing the Bible. And it was, you know, and, and you're aware of this and maybe your listeners are as well, but you know, it's, it's the whole idea of the enlightenment essentially said, we're going to reject anything that is supernatural, anything that was a traditional source of knowledge, right. like the Bible, we're going to reject. And, and now the test becomes science, logic, and reason. And if we can't right, exactly. prove it with science, logic, or reason, then, then, you know, we're not going to have it. And so there was this concerted effort to deny anything that was supernatural. So, so the, the miracles of Jesus, you had to explain those away through naturalism, the resurrection right. of Christ. Well, all of a sudden that didn't happen. And now you have to come up with these naturalistic ideas. And so there was a lot of that going on within the church, people trying to explain away in naturalistic right. terms, the supernatural. And the fundamentalists came along. They say, well, wait, you can't do that. And so right. they really planted their flag in the fact that, no, the supernatural exists. Miracles are real. The resurrection is legit. It occurred. Right. A good example. It changed the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A good example of a figure that maybe people are aware of um, that at least recently got a little bit of publicity was Martin Luther King Jr. He was at the time of that liberalism, and he denied the virgin birth. He denied the deity mm -hmm. of Christ. Those were the sorts of things. And and what they did was – you're exactly right – they they attempted to provide a naturalistic answer for everything, and then we saw what the, we or we have seen what this is birthed into the worship of science, where people philosophically don't even understand that there are multiple different ways to get to different types of truth, right? In that mm -hmm. um, science does not is not the deciding factor on how we determine truth in every area of life, right? There are sometimes exactly. it's more of a of of a of a mental philosophical way just to kind of say that in simpler terms uh that we would come to right. the truth right but uh yeah right. yeah i totally agree with that and another point probably that's um that's good to throw out there and to highlight about um something that you said was i asked how your conversion your transition took place from dispensationalism uh to, to more of like a covenant theology sort of view. And I think you know what I'm getting ready to get at. My next question was yeah. to ask how you went from pre-trip to post-trip, but it was it was impossible for you to speak about one without the other. And this is something that I've been harping on for a while, and that's that, um, 
And I realized this, I, I figured this out internally through my own journey and just doing retrospect on how I transitioned from dispensationalism to covenant theology and then from covenant theology to a what would be considered a partial preterist position and ultimately a post-millennial position. And it was that I, I didn't know it at the time, but I found out later that the two, that is dispensationalism and premillennialism, are, you could say, inextricably linked to one another. I mean, dispensationalism itself is, as you discussed, the 70th week. Like, it can be summarized there. The... the uh, underscored, you know, aspect of dispensationalism in American evangelical churches today is Israel and the church. And how are they able to purport this position by slicing off that last week and and giving that, you know, to keep the analogy, that, that last slice of the pie for Israel later. And therefore, we're able to kind of do this shift back and forth. Oh, we, as you put it, very well. They, they put a pause button. That's a good way to word it for the kingdom. And then we'll just, you know, offer that to them later. And then we can kind of in- reintroduce them into the story. So mm-hmm. They, you, you can't talk about one without talking about the other. Yeah. Yeah. Ex- well, and that's, that's where, so that's what I'm saying as far as the, you know, really digging into and changing my position on, the 70 weeks prophecy, I, it became a linchpin, at least for me. That's how I've described it to others because it required, it required me to rethink everything. And especially in terms of eschatology, um, it, it, I had to rethink those things as a result. If you don't have the 70th week, it's like the, it's like the foundation for everything else. Then, then what do you have? And so that's where I began to question things like, okay, the, the, the kingdom of God, Um, you know, uh, same thing with, you you mentioned kind of the, you know, how, what do we make of the, the church Israel distinction? What's the relationship there? What is, what is the relationship between the old covenant and, and the new covenant? There's, there's all of these things that really just kind of, they're, they're woven in together. And for me, it was one of those things that I was mentioning there. I didn't have like a bunch of people that I could talk to and be like, you know, just bounce things off like we're doing here. Like, this is great. You right. can bounce something off of somebody or, or share, you know, and, and you, you're, it helps you to think it helps you to actually do that. Well, if you have no one to talk to, if you're just kind of all alone and isolated, it's like, you know, and you've got questions, where do you go? And so, you know, um, I went to, to different books. Um, that, that keep in mind, I'm, I'm, you know, books aren't the end all be all. I, I, if, absolutely affirm that the Bible is the final authority for faith and practice. Absolutely. But when we talk to each other, even, even what we do in church, when, when, when there's preaching and teaching, and if there's a, that opportunity to ask right. questions and some of those things we are learning. And it's, it's the same kind of activity as if you were to get your nose in a book because you are hearing absolutely. the thoughts of somebody else. And so for, for me, that's where, again, I started looking at different resources. Um, so Philip Morrow became, you know, one of the first that I went to. When I was thinking about the kingdom and how the kingdom worked out, um, I ended up going. I ended up, uh, you know, going to George Lack and and as far as uh, reading his book, I forget what it is, the Kingdom of God or something like that. Just a little book, but it really kind of helped set the stage. He was a historic premillennialist. Now at that time, I didn't want to have anything to do with amillennialism or postmillennialism. I thought, I mean, that was that was a bridge too far for me at that time. Yeah, those are I was bad really words. Comfortable Right. Yeah, I, I was felt that way. So I have to throw that out there. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And so, and it's like that with, you know, even for for people who are watching this and you're struggling with these things, like you might be in one of those areas to where, like, just to go from pre-trib to post-trib, like that's monumental. And and you, f- I mean, just to even that in my own life, there were some serious consequences as far as right. some of the relationships. And how that affected things and how that affected things ultimately with with the church that I was at, all that kind of stuff. And so I understand that there is a real it it's really, really easy to do the go along to get along thing and to just kind of hold your nose, re- reject where your your where your mind and where the spirit of God is leading you and just uphold the tradition that you're in. Right. I, and I just never. I've never 
been that way. And sometimes nice. I wish I was because usually, to, you know, just it gets me in trouble. Um, just trying yeah, to no, follow I'm where the spirit got, God leads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that's that's where I was, you know, in 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 exposure to some of these different views. And granted, I didn't not everything I agreed with. I read I read a book on when I was going through after my Daniel series. I just kind of continued on, and we started to do um, a series on Matthew and the Olivet Discourse, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so, one of the books that I turned to, um, I actually uh, turned to a book. Um, what is it called? Oh, I forget what it is. Um, but it's a, it's an amillennial book um, by by a pastor. He's kind of a charismatic pastor, a guy that I normally probably wouldn't agree with on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Storms. Um, oh yeah, I know exactly King, who Sam Storms is. Yeah, Kingdom Come. That, that's the name of the book, Kingdom Come. And there was a lot of stuff I disagreed with, but there was a lot of stuff that I found really helpful and kind of eye opening, and helped me to piece things together and work things out in, in my in my own mind. Um, and so that's that's where some of those things began to be a real a real help to me. Um, and of course, you know, um, reading the Bible and continuing to study and to work these things out, you become more and more confident in your position. It was pretty easy for me to kind of hang out in the the, the historic pre mill area. Um, oh, yeah. it, it was probably I, I'll have to admit it, it might have been just as hard or maybe even a little bit harder to go from historic pre-mill to to something other than that and and you kind of discussed it i i'm kind of in this maybe a blend i'm not sure what i think of it so far between post-millennialism and amillennialism but of course of course the kingdom of god and what that means for us here today plays a big part of that um but but i knew that that going that one step further i was i was really on the outs in fact i i almost felt like taking that final step essentially you know i was um which was which step was that was that the step from historical pre-mill yeah to yeah the, 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 yeah yeah the millennial yeah so, the yeah millennial i agree position. with that yeah mm -hmm. that's that was much harder for me yeah so from from more of a and i held a very light position it was not a strong commitment to pre-trib at all. I was never really grounded in it, and if you would have asked me, I would have told you that I was pre-trib. But I, um, you know, I, I didn't really, I, I, I didn't have any convictions about it for sure. Um, so when I when I switched from pre-trib to post-trib, it was relatively simple. I didn't have a lot of heartburn about it. But when I moved from post-trib pre-wrath to my now position of post-millennialism. That was much much more difficult, and that took me years. Yeah, yeah. And I Wait, went that's, through, that's and I went where, to, uh, go, you go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, that's, that's where my struggle was, and I think it was more of a mental thing than anything else. You know, I've, I've, my, my entire adult life, I have been associated with, with independent fundamental Baptist circles, right? Um, and I know, of of absolutely no one maybe besides yourself now no one else has has you know as far as the millennial position it is it's always been some type of pre-mill whether it's dispensational right. or historic pre-mill and so for me that it almost felt like i was putting myself out in no man's land almost yeah. like almost kind of like well do, do i have a family anymore so to speak you know as right. far as just even kind of a bigger group that i can call my own or that I feel comfortable with, because now it seems like I've really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a place where no one else is. And, um, and even that can be kind of head trippy, like, cause you're thinking, you know, it, it, you know, am, am I really that far gone? I mean, you, you can, you can kind of think of some right. of those things, but then when you put it in perspective of history, you know, as far as what have, what has the, the, the church historically believed, where have other people been historically, Absolutely. And you yeah. realize, well, it's it, you're not in such a lonely place as you think you are, although exactly. it might feel lonely in the day and age today. So yeah, most people are are yeah. totally unaware of that. That you know the yeah. you know if we look at uh, the history of modern you know uh, pre millennialism, which is which is dispensational pre millennialism, uh, that I mean that's a that's a, a 19th century you know um, 
invention, I, I, I could say. Exactly. And as, as you referenced there multiple times, there's, there's historic pre-mill, but that was almost non-existent in church history. It was, um, I think it was yep. the, the, a part of the second and then third century. And um, I've come to my own um, reasons on why I believe that the church held to uh, the still held to at, at certain times. And there were already positions that were formulating of a, a, a sort of ah mill, an optimistic ah mill. And, and uh, you know, from some angle, it may look like a post millennial position. But I think it was from the influence of uh, the Jewish religion still at that time. And there still was an influence that they had, even after the diaspora. Uh, I think that uh, that that idea, you know, of a physical king, a physical kingdom, being present on earth, the the same error that we see the Jews making, you know, when they're, you know, expecting their Messiah, right, to look like yeah. a certain, you know, to look a certain way. I think that's why we see it early on in church history. But as the church grows and blossoms and and continues to uh, evolve, um, they work through these things and they separate themselves more and more from what had become, you know, apostate Old Testament religion, and then they kind of birth into the New Covenant Church. That's just my opinion on what I think may have happened there. But historic. But the, what I was saying was, you're exactly right. It's historic pre mill, but it's almost non-existent in church history. It's it's right. few and far between, and. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I I totally agree with all the you know the sentiments and and everything that you put forth as far as um, the distance that's felt, the difficulty that it is, and many times um, we we have um, I had brother Bruce Gore on not too long ago as I you know mentioned to you before we went live here started recording, and he he made a statement I really like this uh, chronological snobbery. And that is that we look at the time that we're in today, and we think that's all that matters. That's all that's ever been. Yeah. <clears throat> so we may seem to today because we, you know, we can be egocentric. We may think, you know, that um, that how can I get so far away from the church, right? The, you know, all of my fellow Christians uh, today. But the the uh, the theology of the church today, being dispensational and and premillennial is not common throughout church history. So that can give us some comfort in that respect. Well, it, exactly, exactly. And that's, so that's part of where, you know, my journey is, is really kind of taken me as well as, you know, really examining things. Um, you know, I, if you look at, if you look at church history with a real objective eye, and, and I was looking at it when I was looking into some of these things, I was looking at it in particular from the standpoint of dispensational theology versus like covenant theology. And um, and it became very very apparent to me that dispensationalism is a 19th century creation, along with other movements as well, like Jehovah's yeah. Witnesses and and Mormons. Yeah. There was there was actually a, a bunch of different movements that came out of the 19th century. The second kind of this great awakening. That, right, right, right. Yeah, it's yeah. the attitude that we're going to wake up the sleeping church, you know, and we're, we've got the right. answer now. And dispensationalism was certainly a part of that. And so, um, you know, I really wanted to understand more as far as systematic theology and how people thought and how worldview really affects kind of the way we think today. Um, so, again, I, I looked to, to other resources. Um, there was this um, and I forget what it is, um, but it's a book essentially that 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 uh, co it's called Covenantal and Dispensational Theologies. It's a small little book. It's uh, written from uh, from four different scholars, each with their own respective position. Um, you've got covenant theology, kind of proper, kind of more from the Presbyterian kind of side of things. You've yeah. got uh, something called progressive covenantalism. You've right. got um, uh, what is it? Progressive progressive dispensationalism, and then kind of the more uh, they lumped it together called a, a traditional dispensationalism. And so that was a real eye opener for me because. You know, I was I was looking at that book, trying to kind of reevaluate reevaluate myself, just knowing what I know now. You know, as I was reading this book, I'm like, well, where where do I fall, right? And so for me, I really began to gravitate. Um, I I kind of gravitated toward the progressive dispensational side of things, although there were some real sticking points and where I really felt at home as far as what I would call, I guess, a systematic theology that maybe fit where I was the best 
was progressive covenantalism. And um, which a lot of people are going to be like, well, what the heck is that? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, it, there's other names that it can go by, it's, for instance, New Covenant Theology, although there is some differences, right? It's, it's um, you know, there's probably some minor, minor things as far as progressive uh, covenantalism. But all that to say, um, you know, I as, as I really just kind of try to broaden my horizon and really just kind of critically think if someone holds to this kind of dispensational theology, whether that's, you know, traditional covenant theology or progressive covenantalism or progressive dispensationalism or whatever, how is how is that going to affect your worldview, your your view on life, your view of where right. you think the world is going and all of those kind of things? Because we bring that, you know, you know, many of us don't realize it. It's just kind of right. we take it for granted. But when we read our Bibles, we bring our worldview with us and we filter Absolutely. all those words of Scripture through that worldview mm -hmm. of what we think is going on. And so. So that was a real that was a real helpful you know thing exercise I guess you could say as far as for me to kind of work through some other other things as well and um, and then you know it's it's like as I say you know you pull on that thread and you know everything just kind of starts to unravel or you, you see more and more things you know that that, that you know we, we we were talking just a moment ago about the enlightenment like four years ago like. I could maybe tell you what the enlightenment is, but I couldn't tell you anything more than that or what kind of effect it has had on, on world right. history and church history. Like I just, I wouldn't be able to tell you and I probably wouldn't think anything of it. Like big deal, the enlightenment, you know, but, um, but man, that has really affected us. It's really affected our worldview. And in particular, you know, the, the, the practical Christian life, the day in day out mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And, and, and ultimately you know, what we're here on earth for and where we think the world is going. Right. Um, and so all of that stuff is really, you know, I've, ha I've had to wrestle with all of that stuff has come about just simply because I was trying to be open and honest with the Bible and let the Bible change my thinking rather than imposing my thoughts onto the Bible. Um, right. So, so, so when you yeah. said you believe the Bible, you really meant it. And if you had to change, you, you really meant it. <laughs> well, that's just it. Yeah. I mean, one of the things, and I, and I credit my dispensational upbringing for this, right. Is, um, and, and the previous pastors that I had, you know, it was drilled in my head and I shared this with you, um, you know, earlier that the Bible is the final authority when it comes to, you know, faith and practice. And so, um, and I've really been, th that was really kind of one of my guiding tenets um, is I was researching these things out. So like with the pre-trib rapture, if I can't find it in the Bible, why am I holding on to it? Right. Because, because it means I'm holding on to a tradition. That's, that's what I'm doing. I am upholding a tradition and I'm defending a tradition mm -hmm. and there is a time and place for tradition. I don't think tradition is all bad and wrong, right. but it's, it is bad and wrong when we hold tradition to the place of scripture. And that's, that's what I was right. doing. And so that was just one of those, those things. And that's where I found myself on in trouble with other believers who are of that <laughs> persuasion. Cause, cause they think now I'm going against the Bible. I'm going against your tradition. You can't right. show me in the Bible where there's a preacher of rapture. It's nowhere in there. Not at right. all. You think it's somewhere because of what you're reading into the text. But, you know, you're not reading it out of the text. And so it's like that with so many other things. Um, <clears throat> and that's where I've just, you know, tried to be honest. And I know, like, just knowing myself, I know that there are still things. And I'll catch myself where I'm reading something into the text. And so I just, over the over the you know, the past few years anyway, I've been really just sensitive or trying to be sensitive to the fact of, you know, what does the Bible say in its original context? What did the All author right. want to communicate to its original audience? And, and am, am I, am I, you know, trying to make the Bible conform to my ideas or am I conforming my mind to what the Bible has to say? That's a real challenge. It really can't right, be. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Brother Scott. What was it in particular, if you had to give me, um, you used the, the word sticking point. That's perfect. Like, what was the sticking point when it came to your conversion? Let's say first, um, and, and, and if they go together, that's fine if they overlap. But 
um, dispensational to a form of covenant theology? What was the sticking point? Was it Daniel's 70th week, as you alluded to earlier? And what text would you say? Yeah, um, you know, the the issue the issue of of maybe like a systematic theology, whether you're talking covenant theology or dispensational theology, that wasn't that wasn't a very um, big thing that I was focused on in in the very beginning. It was it was how does this eschatology kind of work out? And as I was as I was working through those things, the sticking points for me is is I've seen I've seen what happens when other people stick their neck out. I've seen how other Christians act towards them and put them out and malign them and everything else. And in in am I and I was a, and I was pretty much a brand new pastor. It, it, am I it, it, you know is is that a is that a fight that I want to pick right now? Um, no, not really. Um, you know, I was never looking for I was never looking for a fight. I was never looking for a conflict. I just really wanted to be true to the Bible. And um, but I found the more and more I was true to the Bible, the, the the more and more in trouble I got with other people, with other believers telling me how they think I should act, do and think. And um, and so that's kind of that's kind of one of those sticking points. I think I think if there's something right now, you know, I think there's a lot of people that if anything, they're dealing with maybe the pre-trib, post-trib mm-hmm. question. And if they're really honest with themselves, I can't find it in the text. Mm -hmm. Um, But if I if I come out the other side of this thing, how is that going to affect my relationship with my church family, with my family? Mm -hmm. How's it going to affect my relationship with with my peers? How's it going to affect my relationship with other other churches? If you're a pastor, what is that going to do for me in the long run? Like when you're a pastor. You're in full time ministry, and you know I hate the term employee. You're not really an employee of the church, but it's kind of what you are. Like that's where you make your living, right? So you get too far away from where your church has kind of planted its flag, and the next thing you know, you got to go. You know well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you are you are you willing to lose your position, to lose your income? To put your family in a a you know in a in a precarious situation, are, are you are you willing to put your wife and and have her be a worry wart because they're wondering how their babies are going to get taken care of? Um, th- there's all that kind of stuff, especially if you're a pastor that's going through your head, and you it's it's the it's the I mean I'm saying the quiet part out loud. People don't Mm -hmm. like to talk about that. They don't like to think it even bothers them. But I guarantee if you're a pastor out there and you're debating on, you know, maybe you're even convinced kind of secretly, yeah, this is true, but you're not going to come out in a public way and and say that because of the, of the, you know, pushback that you're going to get. And so that, that for me was a bit of a, was a bit of a sticking point as well. Um, it's it's um I can I can tell you the real the real liberating thing for me and what really kind of helped me especially you know continue my my journey I guess of, of search and discovery I'm gonna call it that is um I felt an immense sense of of freedom and even kind of liberation when I when I resigned the pastorate of my old church and and not because like all of a sudden you know I'm gonna you know, I'm going to show those guys or, you know, you don't, you can't, you can't control me. It wasn't anything like that. It was just more right, not out of resentment of, or bitterness or right. anything like that. It, exactly. It was more, I have the freedom and I have the liberty to pursue the right. truth in a way that I, without consequences, I, felt I couldn't right that I couldn't do before because, because, you know, once that happened, I was in no man's land, right? I, I, I'm in, I was in a wilderness. In some sense, my family's still in the wilderness, right? Yeah. It's just just kind of the way it is. Um, but I don't have any fear. I, I don't have any fear of repercussion. Um, I'm I'm to the point anymore. While I I you know it's not my my intent or purpose to offend anybody or or anything. Um, and and it's not that I don't 
want to, I, I don't want to come off as like, I don't care what other people think because certainly I do. I want to be respectful, but at the same time, I'm at this point where it's like, um, your traditions don't have to bother me. Right. And I don't have to hold your traditions. And yeah, I, I don't want to make I, this sound too sig significant. I don't want to make this sound too significant, but uh, in some sense, when any uh, valuable revolution has taken place for the, the sake of the truth, whether it be spiritual or not, but we'll put it in, you know, the, you know, the, the context of the environment of, of theology, whenever that takes place, obviously um, the, the early part of it, the former part of it, there's going to be a lot of people that have to take serious sacrifices and they end up having to, to bear most of the the difficulties, right? And Martin Luther is a perfect example of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, his his life was far from glorious. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we we don't think of it like that now because now we are reaping the fruit of what he did um, in Western America and the result of the Protestant Reformation and everything that we have here today. But that was not the case during his life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a cost there. There's a real cost to pursuing the truth. And, um, you know, Jesus told, told us about what that cost is. Um, and I guess for me, it just, it hit home in a, in a completely, it, it became real. It became palpable, you know, to, to pursue, to pursue what I believe the Bible is actually saying. It's, it's going, it's going to cost me. And it's going to cost me right. some some real significant ways. And it's not just going to affect me. Right. It, it's going to affect my family. I, I think that's one of the things where, where if, if I struggle, if anything, it's, it's, it's watching how my family has had to, in some sense, suffer right. um, be, because of some of this, this stuff and how they have been treated mm -hmm. by other people. And, and maybe some of the isolation and the loneliness, you know, that, that they feel. Um, right. And so that, that stinks, that that's hard, especially as a, yeah. as a, as a man, as a, as a husband, you know, someone who, you know, every, every husband, every man feels the, the, the sense in which they are to, to take care of their family, to provide for their family, to make sure that their family is safe and secure. And when, when some of that stuff you know, is, is, is taken away, try as you might. Um, it, that's, that's hard. And so for me, you know, as, as I evaluate what the cost is in pursuing truth, it, it's some of it, and it's not just me bearing the cost. I wish I could bear it all, but I, but I, I can't. Right. And, and my family is bearing the cost as well. So that that's hard. Yeah. That that can be that can be difficult. And I think this is again why so many people kind of get they stay locked into a yeah, yeah. Uh, into a tradition or 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 a place of comfort, right? We're not going to we're Certainly. not going to shake the apple cart. We're not going to rock the boat. Why is that? Because as soon as you start doing that, well then things are going to get messy. And it's just right. easy to 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 have a nice peaceful comfortable life, right? Um right. And I guess it's been far from that for me. Um, but but I don't regret it at the same time. Like I, I can't and you get this. It's it's hard to express this to other people, but there is an um, the the sense of freedom and liberty I feel to pursue Christ without without any any kind of strings from anybody else is is incredible. I mean, it really is incredible. And it's 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 sobering at the same time because at the, you know at the same time you don't you know I'm I'm very careful I don't I I want to be careful what I'm teaching others number one, um, number two I want to be careful you know with my own family as far as where they're going I I you know um, so I'm I'm I am by no means um, you know flippant about how I am right, going right. about even my own faith journey and I and I hope people don't don't get the sense that people who, who may be doing something like this, um, that they are, they're just, you know, they're just winging it, um, you, you know, shooting from the hip. It's, it's not, yeah, no, it's like not I told like you, and I mentioned, I think, uh, even in this program right now, um, I went through about five, I mean, six years. I mean, I could see it before that, but where I started to see things and I knew where it was headed 
when the discomfort set in where it was not set in where it was not only you know subconscious and I was heading down a route that I wasn't aware but but conscious like I was I was I I knew where this was headed was probably f a five year journey, um, and yeah, there's a lot of discomfort that that occurred down that you know down that road and and there were you know steps taken slowly as certain things were confirmed um and but ultimately of course you know my my i mean my goal as a christian my goal as a bible student um is to understand the bible to know the bible to know what what is the truth of what scripture says and uh if i li if i happen to live in a day and age where that truth that what scripture says that doesn't change is it popular today well you know too bad because i have a commitment to the truth and i study it yeah. not you know not to not to try to find ways to justify what's popular but i study it to know what god is telling me and to know what it says and um yeah. if through my studies i come to a truth that people don't like you know, as as is said so often, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Ob obviously, that's not to be flippant, but it is to to say that what matters is truth. Of course, there's a discerning mm -hmm. way, a way to have discretion with people, and and um, but nonetheless, at the end of the day, what matters is what does you know Scripture say? Thus saith the Lord. Yeah, no, yeah. I totally agree you know, with all that. And, yeah, I was going to say one of the one of the neat little you know life lessons I guess I've I've learned through all of this. Um, in the IFB world, um, you're you, you know people are 110 percent about everything, and and everything yeah. kind of becomes a hill to die on. Exactly. And 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 one of the things that I've learned through throughout all of this, um, and it just made me more you know I am more confident. And what I believe today than I than I ever have been before, but at the same time, it, it's almost this weird paradoxical effect to where I don't feel the need to beat someone over the head with it. I mean, I I, I love sharing what's on my heart. I'm a I'm a sometimes Absolutely. I'm a keyboard keyboard warrior when it comes to you know Facebook posts and stuff because I just you know I'm trying to trying to you know get it, even my own thoughts just kind of out there so I can comprehend some things. But um, one of the things that that's been helpful for me through all of this is and this goes to, to, to the you know idea of traditions and things like that. Um, it was a few years ago I came across the, the passage, First Corinthians 8 and uh, the first few verses. And, and Paul, he's, he's talking about, um, I forget what it is. I'm not sure if that's the second one, meat, meat sacrifice to idols. That's, that's part of it. But essentially, he says, you know, you, uh, we all know that we have knowledge, you know, and mm -hmm. and knowledge right. puffs up, but the but edified. edified exactly, and 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 then he goes on to say, if any man think he knows anything, he knoweth nothing as he ought to know, right. you know, exactly, and and that's where it's like for for me that was kind of that was one of those things that kind of hit me in between the eyes is is um. You know, when we have all these different theological debates and we're trying to put our positions forward and, we're, and you know, sometimes we get to, to where we're beating each other over the head with with the yeah. truth, you know, because I'm going to show right. you that I'm right. And we're 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 missing something crucial. And and, and that is right. that even the knowledge that we think we have, we probably just just Paul said, you know, nothing as you Don't ought to have know. it. Right. Right. But but what are we missing? We're missing that aspect of love. And so for right. me, I've um. Not, not that I'm any less zealous about the truth. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm obviously perfectly zealous about it, but I'm, I'm, I'm rediscovering, I guess, in my own life, and especially kind of reevaluating different positions when it comes to theological things and traditions and standards or whatever else, um, and just being a lot more, a lot more giving, uh, you, you know, realizing not everything is a hill to die on. And right. and the knowledge that I think is so superior may not be that at all, and I need to be right. careful even with my my own you know stance between me and the Lord. And what do I owe other people? Do I, mm -hmm. you know, I owe them love. That's what I owe them. I right. I owe them love. That's the um, fulfillment of the law: love God, love your neighbor. Right, that's right. Exactly and so that's became you know that's um, I've I've tried to evaluate many other positions through through that lens as far as. You know, when it comes to main and plain, um, 
issues, cardinal issues, you know, yeah, there's there's a there's a time and a place to die on on certain hills, and those are hills yeah. to die on. But but I think what we're really missing today, in particular, is this idea of of discernment, discerning between what is secondary and what mm-hmm. is cardinal, what is main Absolutely. and plain, and and what is tertiary, and yeah. and we we have to be able to discern those things because that that right there is going to dictate the ethic and how we act moving on in the, in the future. And a perfect example of that is Romans 14 and 15. Um, you know, Paul rebuked the Jewish and the, and the Roman factions because they were arguing and bickering about what was the proper day to worship and, and, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and, and Paul really, that that passage is so classic because he, he, he essentially it's the ethic of love like like mm-hmm. look um d- endeavor not to be a stumbling block it doesn't necessarily right. mean that you need to put away your convictions or anything like that but you don't need to do the pharisaical thing and beat people right. over the head with your own convictions and you don't need to make your convictions the standard by which you judge everybody else and then start to call them sinners and and as you're doing that, you are actually dividing the body of Christ, which was Paul's main thing is, is you know, right. unity does not mean uniformity. And his issue was they were dividing the body of Christ where there should have been unity. Um, so that kind of stuff for me today is where I, you know, I'm sensitive to that. I'm, I'm sensitive to yeah. that in many, in many different ways as far as, and I, and I say that little phrase a lot, unity does not mean uniformity. Someone doesn't have to do exactly like me and be exactly like me and, and think and they don't have to do all of the same stuff that I am doing. Other, otherwise, um, what order... does it mean to be long suffering? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And so, um, you know, I, I owe it to, you know, to love other people, um, you know, stand on those cardinal issues, you know, yeah. call out blatant sin. I'm, I'm good with all of that kind of stuff. Right. But um, but I, I I am not interested in the least bit in um in being the judge over someone else's spirituality. Um, yeah, you know, so, so, especially when it comes to those secondary things. Absolutely, All right, brother Scott. Let me ask you this: so we kind of covered there um, the transition um, from the you know, dispensational to covenant theology world. You also discussed you know. Um, the eschatology aspect of it, and you moved first from a pre-trib position to a post-trib position. Um, describe to me, if you would, the the post-trib to the position you hold now. And if you don't mind, maybe this makes more sense. Before we get to that, give just a little bit of an explanation of of what you believe. So, um, I ha- I went through a series on post-millennialism. I've had. Um, a, a guest on that discussed postmillennialism and even how it connects with uh, the, the idea of dispensational and covenant theology, you know, these things a little bit. Um, they may not be, that is, the listeners who've walked through all the other episodes, they may not be too familiar with the differences between amill or amillennialism and postmillennialism. So you coming in and saying, I'm a blend. That could be exceptionally confusing, maybe. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So you well, might have to kind of describe yeah. the nature of the kingdom and the differences that lie there between those two positions, and then the position you hold, sure. if you don't mind. Well, and if if any of your viewers um, are confused as far as you know what are the various millennial positions, whether that's talking about you know I'll throw full preterism in there or amillennialism, right. postmillennialism, premillennialism. There's a there's a great little YouTube channel. I, I don't know the guy or anything like that. So um, you know you're not getting paid for this. this is, <laughs> right, right, right. There's, this isn't like some glowing endorsement. But there's a channel called Ready to Har- Ready to Harvest. The guy actually talks okay. about all sorts of yeah. different faith traditions. It's pretty pretty fascinating. Yeah. But he he does a really good overview as far as on some of the eschatological positions. And essentially, yeah, I've I like seen how he that. He's it. pretty objective. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, he really tries to be fair. He's he's trying not to give his opinion in those videos. He's really just trying to get the facts. And so all of the millennial positions, you know, it's 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 what you do, I guess you could say, with the return of Christ. When does the return of Christ happen? 
and and what is the return of Christ as far as its relationship to the kingdom? Does the right. kingdom does does Jesus come first and then you have the kingdom, or does the the kingdom happen first and then Jesus comes? Right. So that's right. Uh, you know, essentially that's your your pre mill post mill pre millennialism. Jesus comes first. He comes pre the millennium. The right. post millennial or a millennial position. Jesus comes after the millennium. Yeah, and, and I was so, going to throw that and, out and, there. And, I was going to say technically uh, post-mill yep. and a-mill would both hold to the fact that the return of Christ is after the millennial. It's just yep. where does the millennial reign occur? What does it look like? Yep. Yeah, yeah. they Yeah, so both post-mill and, and a-mill, historically speaking, I mean, a-millennialism is kind of a new moniker. It wasn't you know, it's, it's recently yeah. come up. I don't know how, you, you know, the last couple hundred years or so, mm-hmm. but it used to just be called post-millennialism. Right. And, um, the difference, the difference as I understand it, as far as amillennialism and, and, and post-millennialism is the nature of the kingdom itself. Yeah. So both post-millennial and amillennialism believe that the kingdom of God, it, it, it does take place between now, or, or rather it takes place between Jesus is, um, you know, crucifixion and resurrection and his second coming somewhere. And I in believe that time what that's period, referred to as most of the time is the interadvental period. That's what the phrase yep, that people yep. use. That's the time period when the kingdom or the millennial exactly. reign, as people will say, or the kingdom occurs. Yep. Yep. Or as, or as the dispensationalists will say the church age, right? So yeah, yeah, so that's, that's right. You know, yeah. Yeah. And, so yeah, there's a little it, bit of a truth in that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is, there is. I mean, there's, there's, yeah. Um, they're not, they're not completely out to lunch on, on maybe some of that <laughs> stuff. Um, you know, the amillennial position believes more that the kingdom of God is taking place now. So it's, in other words, the, the, the kingdom of God or the millennium is the entire interadvental period um, between the first coming and the second coming. That entire period is the kingdom of God, but that the kingdom is not taking place on earth. It's taking place in heaven. So that's how I understand the amillennial position, and so people rule and reign. You go to you go to be with the Lord in heaven, and you rule and reign somehow in in heaven, and that's that's kind of the classic kind of amill position. Whereas the postmillennial position, as I understand it, actually believes that that no, there is a physical aspect to the kingdom here on earth, um, and and so it's not just all spiritual. It's not just all taking place in heaven. But there is a physical component of the of, of the kingdom here on this earth. However, that however that looks. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I, I think a, a simple way of saying is that there's a physical effect too. Right? In an amill position, mm-hmm. might um, some of them more optimistic than others may agree with that. You know, uh, to some degree. Right, right. Well, I mean, um, you know, post millennialism is is typically. As, you know, you kind of mentioned it, it's it's um it's optimistic, whereas amillennialism tends to be more pessimistic, right? So, meaning post millennialism, this is and it's not a bad attitude to have. It's it's actually quite yeah. biblical. Jesus yeah. Jesus is the one who said all power is given to me in heaven and in earth, right? So right. so he's got all the power, and Jesus also told his church to essentially go and conquer, and that the right. gates of hell. Would would not prevail, or I might put withstand against um, the the advance of the church. So, in other words, you can just see kind of the church marching towards the gates of hell, and 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 it's tearing down the gates of hell, um, you know, because it's it's effective. So, the post millennialism idea is essentially the Great Commission is going to be effective. More and right. more people are going to get saved, um, and and ultimately, you know, um, so. You know, as far as um, yeah, I'm thinking of what's his, what the heck is that guy's name? I can't think of his name right now, but there, there's some post mill people that essentially believe that the entire world will will be evangelized um, and that and that as a result of that, there is going to be a golden age, um, which I guess, you, you know, some properly call the millennium um, or a or a 
you know, a, I know, a I know that's what a lot of the Puritans it's... believed as well. Yeah, and that there yeah. would be there, yeah. and some of them actually held to. I think Jonathan Edwards, as an example, uh, held that there would be a literal thousand years that yep. would culminate exactly. it, and, and and that would be the golden age. And, and yep. I, I personally, as you know, being post mill myself, um, I do believe that the nations will be converted. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we, you know, the specifics of how many, right. That can, you know, that that's unanswered, right. Scripture doesn't tell you that, but it, right. what it does, well, the reason that I'm convinced that the, the nations will be converted. Number one, the whole second half of the book of Isaiah speaks to this. It's about the new covenant, the Gentiles coming in, but specifically an emphasis on this reign of Christ. And in that time period, all nations will come to the house of the Lord. Right? Yep. We see the Great Commission, the New Covenant, all of that taking place in the New Testament Scripture, and that's what's said. And then we also have the language of uh, Christ's parable, which when I was pre-mill, uh, a futurist, I had no explanation, and I've never heard one for uh, the parables that Christ would tell about the leaven. I never heard at yeah. least anything compelling, yeah. but they, the, you know, that uh, the kingdom of, of God or the kingdom of heaven is like leaven and, you know, um, two lumps and the whole is until the whole is leavened. Um, right. Right. Oh, that's yeah, a little seed have, and it grows into the greatest tree. And exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It starts yeah. off small. Yeah. And, and this all harkens <clears throat> back to Daniel two, the image, the statue, Bingo. the feet, which would be the fourth empire, Rome. Yep. That's when the you know the uh, the kingdom comes to earth, and when it does, it starts off like a, it's referred to as a stone. A stone is something that's small, and it grows. It says until a great mountain, great big mountain, until it fills yep. all of the earth. I think exactly. that that's powerful, profound language that is speaking to the conversion of the world. And uh, yeah. like you mentioned, Christ's great commission. It doesn't speak of failure. It speaks to success. When he's telling them, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. You look at the, the, the Matthew version. When he, when he tells them to, to go and to preach the gospel, he tells them to preach the gospel, to baptize, to teach them all things. The assumption or the implication is that it's going to happen. Like, hey, preach to them. They're going to believe it. Baptize them. And then, right, and then he continues and teach all nations. And then he even gives a, another encouragement that this is going to be successful. And then he tells them, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Um, yeah, th that's kind of just me throwing out there. I believe, you know, I do believe that uh, towards the end that there will be, you know, some that scripture, I think, clearly teaches there'll be some sort of an apostasy um, in, in some you know, uh, level, right. To, to not get into specifics on that either. Uh, but, um, certain passages seem to suggest that to me, but nonetheless, like when Christ comes back and he tells the parable of his return, um, there's tares among the wheat, right? That's one of the examples, but it's still tares within a wheat field. The, the, the world mm -hmm. represents the wheat field and the wheat yeah. field is the majority in some sense, right. Of the nations yep. being converted. I think that language is is uh, replete <clears throat> in the minor prophets, and I just kind of overlooked that in time past. But I think the the minor prophets, the major prophets, speaking of the time of the reign of Christ and the new covenant, is replete with the prophecy of the nations being converted. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I, it's it's, it's he heavy. He yeah, heavy, heavy on, on um, heavy emphasis on the kingdom. And it, and it makes yeah. sense. So this is one of those things, you know, growing up in dispensational circles. It's like, how do you, what do you do with the kingdom of God? Because right. when I was, when I was a dispensationalist, my worldview was that, well, I need to get saved so I can go to heaven when I die. Like that was the goal. The goal is to go to heaven. The goal is to leave this yeah. earth. This earth is, is going to hell in a handbasket and we just mm -hmm. need to escape. Like that's, that's the goal. We got to go, we got to go to heaven. And I, I did not understand how Jesus' kingdom fit into all of this. And what was particularly troubling for me is that the, the emphasis, the heavy, heavy central emphasis of the kingdom in the Gospels. And, right. and for me, it almost, it, it, because I was not, you know, I, I years ago, I, I didn't really know anything about 
how the entire Bible fit together or what the, the major prophets and minor prophets, what they contributed to this idea of the kingdom. And for me, it almost felt like this, this kingdom idea is just coming out of nowhere. Like all of a sudden Jesus comes and he's talking about the kingdom. And yeah. for me, it kind of felt like this is a brand new idea. And, and where, where is, where is, you know, what, how does Jesus pulling this out of, but for the, it became clear that for the people, if you read the gospels, they, they hadn't, they hadn't, it was an expectation. The idea that, that, that uh, of God becoming king, say it that way. That was that was just their cultural expectation. Like mm -hmm. the idea of 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 the kingdom and its prominence in the world and and defeating defeating you know the enemies. Like that was what they were all about. They had a certain idea Absolutely. of how that was all going to look, and their idea of how it looked was misguided and wrong. Whereas right. Jesus kind of re I don't want to say I hate the word reinterpret, but in some sense Jesus reinterpreted. Those those kingdom prophecies, or he aligned them yeah, rather around yeah. himself. And um, but but all that to say, it's it's um, you know, I think that's where a lot of dispensationalists struggle, and even premillennialists, right? Because what do you do? What do you do with the kingdom? Has the kingdom been inaugurated? It, right. One of the things that was you you mentioned it, like when I was doing my Daniel study, and I got to Daniel too. And and you have that prophecy, the big statue and the little stone that smashes the feet that grows into a great big mountain. It's like, oh, well, that's interesting. And you yeah. know, go over to Daniel chapter seven and you got these four beasts and you have the son of man figure who who defeats Absolutely. the beasts and reigns forever. And and it's exactly like as I was studying through that stuff, I, I, I my mind, knowing the gospels at least as well as I did at that time, went to some of those same parables that you were just raising it's like wait a second jesus talked about this and this, mm -hmm. this, this it's the same idea that the kingdom of god starts off as something small right but then it grows into something big and we see the template for that in the book of acts i mean jesus mm -hmm. told them what the template was you know what, what's going to happen you're gonna you're gonna start in jerusalem work yourself out to judea samaria into the other most parts of the earth. Like it's, it's going to expand. And as we've looked right. at where we've come from over the last 2000 years, yes. Is, is the world, is the world what it should be? No. Is it, but, but I don't think we really understand just how far the world has come and how Absolutely. the darkness of idolatry has been soundly defeated. And even I mean, think about it. Um, even for those people who do not worship Jesus, they don't they don't believe he is God. They don't believe he is Lord. They don't believe right. he's king. But they still know who he is. Right. Worldwide over. Very few, very few, I would say, have no inkling of who Jesus is. And that is it. That is a testament to this idea of the expanding kingdom. What started off small and just a Jerusalem movement has now taken over the entire world. And it's like you said, just as some of the prophets would say, you know, that the, um, you know, the, the, the word of the Lord, the presence of the Lord would, would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And, and it's, and it's incredible when, when you think about that and then how that ties into, how that ties into, to, uh, you know, to, to temple theology, as right. far as, you know, the temple being the place where God's presence dwells. And we are that right. temple. And where is the temple of God today? Well, it's not in any one particular location. You could say that the temple is the holy Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, if you will, the heavenly Jerusalem. But but the temple is scattered around all over the earth. Yeah. Um, and that's so it's like all of that kind of stuff. You know, as I started to connect that and put that stuff together, it was really it was just really fun. Yeah, to, it's like what to, uh, John four. I just thought of, it's like what Christ says to the Samaritan woman and when you know she's asking about Jerusalem right and he explains yep. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth and he says the time's coming when they're neither going to worship in Jerusalem this mountain what it, you know his point is anywhere and everywhere right is what he gets yeah. to yeah and yeah exactly. and I totally agree with you one thing that we just have such a pessimistic attitude today in America in American Christianity because of like you were talking about our worldview 
people have no idea oftentimes that they even have a worldview. And those are the most dangerous people. They, they don't even know they have all these biases and that they have a, a set of beliefs in which they're looking at the world. But um, the world, uh, it, it, to be quite frank, compared to the ancient world, um, what we experience today is significantly better in a, yeah. in a moral sense. Now, obviously, um, um, you know, it's incremental. But if you just if you if you think of like uh, Brother Scott, you know, whether you would rather live today in 2024 or the 1500s, you'd pick the you'd pick 2024. Would you rather live in the 1500s or a thousand? Right. A.D. You'd pick 1500. So if we look at year by year when it's small, you know, we, if we kind of zoom in, of course, you're going to say, well, things here in America seem like they're getting worse. But if we zoom out and we look at maybe if it's like Levin, right, maybe if it's like a stone that's growing, if we zoom out and we look at it in 500 year chunks, would you rather mm -hmm. live in a thousand or 500, 500 to, you know, zero AD? It's very clear that there is a progressive, there's a difference and the world, you know, uh, the reason why we refer to it as the ancient world is there's been dramatic changes from that time period, from uh, 70 AD, from the time of Christianity. And Christianity itself, the, 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 the advancements and the developments that the, world, that the world as a whole experiences came out of the West. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it was the white man, right? It was because of Christianity. Christianity brought us the, the scientific advancements that we have today, which would pour over into health, would, you know, uh, agricultural advancements, uh, all sorts of technology that we experience. I mean, can you imagine one of the minor prophets riding around in a Tesla and seeing a, a television that's on it? And you, you take them to your house and you show them your pantry and you have cinnamon and all these things that are exotic spices. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you, you show them your leather couch that you sit on and you take them out in your backyard and and they they you, they go to work with you as you sit down and and the average American is works on a computer many at least do it's common uh, they work in an office in air conditioning I mean what what it is is number one we're spoiled yeah, number but number two we have a pessimistic worldview today and yeah. uh you know, we th <clears throat> you know, we forget about things like the gladiatorial games we forget about things of how prevalent homosexuality was even in places that were more civil like the among the Greeks and the Romans and just how bloody and violent the world was in time past and we forget about we we, we are sensitive we've been desensitized I should say to the blessings of God today as we have air conditioning in our vehicles and you can go on and on and on and those all of those advancements stem from the Western world and specifically the presuppositions of Christianity, the worldview of Christianity. Exactly. Christianity has, has, exactly. has transformed the world. It really has. And that's a part of yeah. the, the post-millennial position uh, that, that yeah. um, the gospel goes in and it changes the hearts of men. And when it changes the hearts of men, it changes men. And when it changes men, it changes culture. And when it changes culture, it will ultimately, you know, subculture to culture to the world. And that's truly what that's, has happened. That's, bingo, bingo. I mean, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned Jonathan Edwards earlier, um, but even kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, during, you know, what we might call the first great awakening, you know, there's a, there's a concept. And I can't remember exactly when this came up, but you've heard of it, you know, the Protestant work, work ethic. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And, and and where where does where does all that come from? And <clears throat> it, it, it's a testament to how the worldview, the the mindset from, from which people approached life, like it was it was different. It's we 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 are we we tend to think that every generation previous to us looked at the world the same way that we do in some sense. Yeah, and we and 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 it's. Unfortunately, there is this this pessimistic, you know, attitude towards towards the world. We just think things are going to get worse and worse and worse. Right. We doubt we mm -hmm. doubt that God can, you know, is really going to be victorious in some sense. We think, <clears throat> you know, the devil is is gonna is is gonna win or whatever. 
And, um, and, and that's, and, and, and so that kind of fuels this idea. Well, we just, you know, the best thing that we can hope for, which is an old kind of Epicurean I- ideal. We just need to it escape is. this world, you know, because this world is yeah. bad and, and my body's bad and everything's just going to pot. And so I, you know, we just need to get safe so that we can leave this world and go to a better and more real disembodied heaven, right? Which isn't right. Christianity. That's Plato. No, it's not at all. Right. But, but, but we've bought into, we, we, we bought into that. And that mindset has saturated, saturated the West in particular, C- couple that with, you know, with dispensationalism and how that's really, you know, worked on some of that mindset as well. It, 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 when when you really begin to kind of examine that, it's it becomes clear how you can see like you know what is the what is the difference between the generation today and say like three hundred years ago when you had things like the Protestant work ethic and and right. Christians were actually transforming the world in remarkable ways and why right. why why can't we do that today? Well, they had this idea that the goal isn't to escape this earth. It's it's to establish God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And right. and and what does that mean? And it affects every facet of life. That the main, mm-hmm. you know, evangelism is great. Evangelism is something that we should all do. I thank God for people who go out and evangelize. But we have this kind of idea today that that's the only work that really matters. You know, right. yeah. um, we're you know, we're gonna let everything else go to pot. You know, I like how N.T. Wright puts it, you know, we'll we'll do we'll do Band-Aid operations and and we'll take care of people at the bottom of the pile. But we're not going to try to do anything to fix, you know, the structures that that put people in that position. No, because we're going to we're going to tend to the real business of evangelism, which is to save souls for heaven. And evangelism is good, but that's not mentality. It's It's just a short term mentality. Bingo. And and that, that short term mentality is fueled by this defeatist attitude mm-hmm. that everything's getting worse and everything's going to yeah. pot. And so we just got to escape. And and you can see like how that has really affected the church and the church's the, the church's mission. Like yeah. we've emasculated ourselves. Yeah. Like we, you know, we, we need like kind of that Joshua moment where, you know, you know, quit you like men and you know, knock right. it off, and you're a victor, mm-hmm. so go and act like it. Uh, right, but no, exactly. no, things are things are going bad. And we're, you know, we just this world's not my home. I'm sorry. It's this world is your home. I know what you mean when you say that. And we all look forward to getting to heaven one day. Right. But heaven isn't the end all be all. We're going to be resurrected on this earth, the earth right. in, a, in, a, in a physical body. That's your eternal home, not a disembodied right. heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even yeah, even that, it, like a like a small point there that uh, modern uh, Christianity has wrong oftentimes is that they think that this that this earth that we live on today will be obliterated, right? And and even it itself will be completely destroyed. I mean, that's what I was. Ta- I I grew up in an independent Baptist church. I you know grew up in Christianity. I went to Christian schools a lot of my life, and that's what I was taught. I heard that all the time, and that God is when they said God is going to create a new earth, it was as if He was going to. I, I wouldn't have been able to use this term then, and they didn't use it. But like, there's another, you know, ex nihilo creation. Exactly. They did that's not they understand mean. that God was going to make this world and creation new, just as if He will make our bodies new. Right. In that mm-hmm. same sense, he's going to make this creation new and Bingo. use his creation that he made. And and that speaks to the glory of God. He can take this corrupt, mm-hmm. cursed world and he can make it into something as glorious as what we look forward to in a perfect, very good creation. He can restore it and make it new in that sense. Yeah. Well, there's a, it's that idea of of continuity and discontinuity, like you said, with our with our yeah. own resurrected bodies. We're we're not going to all of a sudden, you know, have brand new bodies while our old body lays in the grave. It doesn't work that way. It didn't right. work that way with yeah. Jesus. His body was transformed out of out of the old. There was continuity there, and yeah. and if you know, and whether you know, I don't know what position you take as far as Second Peter. Whether you believe that's thinking of something that's happened in the past or future, but it has it has that same kind of concept as far as when Peter is talking about. You know, the world, you know, that was talking that about the was, world that yeah. was in the water and out of the waters. And he mm-hmm. and he goes on and he says, and and 
you know, the this, this same world today is now reserved unto fire. In other words, mm -hmm. he, he makes his example shows that it's the same world, but right. this world was was destroyed during the days of Noah. But it wasn't like a brand new thing that just God, God created out of nothing. Right. It was there was some continuity there. And the same thing, even with new heavens and new earth, there is there is continuity. There is something from mm -hmm. the that that's made out of the old that's made into something into something new. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean there, because I, I was the same way. I, I kind of had this yeah. idea that, you know, um, God was just going to, you know, completely wipe all of this stuff away and then all from scratch, just, you know, speak something brand new into existence. And mm -hmm. Even Second Peter doesn't validate that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. That's that's actually yeah, one of the yeah. proof texts that I came to that helped me understand that later, right? Because he compares the mm -hmm. two judgments, like you said. There's continuity and discontinuity. He compares the 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 judgment there of fire to the judgment of water, and he says, "Hey, the way the same way that that worked, and there was an old world, and I made a new world. I'm also going to take this world and make it new in the very same way, right? Which exactly. how, and how did he do that? Well, obviously. It's it was the same the same earth the same matter the same world that we live in, um, but he judged that earth and then made it new in that sense with a new creation. Right. Yeah. Well, and it, yeah, it speaks to it. It speaks to you know what God wanted to do from the very very beginning. I mean Romans Romans chapter eight talks about this as well. Yeah. You know as far as the the creature that is mm -hmm. that is in in bondage. And and it, it waits for the manifestation of the sons of God, you know, and then it yeah. will be redeemed. The curse, the curse will be lifted. And it's it's that it's that same concept. What is you know, what has God wanted to do all along? If God wanted to, you know, just wipe everything away and start from scratch, he could do that. Well, he but, could have done that the, the, right at the fall. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. But he yeah. didn't. The, the whole the whole biblical narrative is this is this story about redemption and restoration Absolutely. that God is redeeming mankind. And in mm -hmm. redeeming mankind, he is going to redeem the earth. Yeah. And, and so this, this, you know, this earth is it, this, this is our home. This is, yeah. You know, in we're Romans not going to live in heaven somewhere. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you, as you just now were referencing it, I'm sure you're aware of this. R Romans eight tells you that the earth itself, the creation itself, not referencing us, but the creation and the earth itself today being under the curse and that bondage groans and waits for its change. Mm -hmm. That makes zero sense if it's going to be a totally different earth that's created ex nihilo that is yeah. uh, entirely separate. From this earth today um yes and it's this suffering for nothing away with yeah it's yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna... for a way to change and for this other creation to take its place that makes yeah, zero yeah. sense if they aren't yeah, if, yeah. That, if the earth today uh in a you know a personification sense if the earth today isn't going to enjoy that and experience it that's nonsensical right right and it just yeah. seems kind of cruel right we're, we're gonna make this earth is gonna suffer and it's right. gonna groan and, and travail and yeah and instead of instead of sweet release to look forward to, no, you get to look forward to just, just total obliteration. Extinction. And I'm going to make something yeah. completely brand new. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm going to yeah. just start over with something else. Yeah, it doesn't right. make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, so you yeah. said that your position would be right there in between an amillennial and post-millennial position. Uh, uh, brother, brother Scott, so I can like you just a little bit more, I'm going to refer to you affectionately as a soft post-millennialist. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, is it, <laughs> Whatever, is it, would you yeah, say it's op optimistic uh, uh, amill? <laughs> Is that well, maybe what you would say? What, what I would what I would say is is you know as I go back to those those classifications earlier as far as amillennialism tends to think that it's all spiritual in heaven, post millennialism yeah. post millennialism at least acknowledges no there's an earthly uh, 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 you know an earthly aspect to all of this, and yeah. so um, I I agree with the post mills in that that the kingdom of God is not all spiritual. Um, so where I where I come from. As far as, you know, kind of where I'm at, um, I believe that the the new creation was inaugurated with the resurrection of Jesus, that he is the first man of the new creation. And he is he is he is not just spiritual, but he is physical. So I, I believe the the new creation is inaugurated, not consummated. I believe full consummation is still yet to come. 
Yeah. But it is, has been inaugurated. And Jesus is the first man of that. And he is physical. Mm-hmm. So in some sense, we can, there's, you know, I, I use the term already, but not yet. There is, there is an already, but yeah. not yet aspect to, right. to new creation. Um, yeah. So Jesus is, Jesus is physical. He rose physically. And now he, he physically, and this blows our minds because we don't think of heaven this way, but Jesus is physically seated in heaven at the father's right hand. Absolutely. And, and not only that, but then he, he, he sent his spirit, which is something spiritual from heaven. And now his spirit now indwells physical beings. So, mm-hmm. so it's just as, is just as Jesus talked about, as far as, you know, you'll see the son, uh, the, uh, you know, the son of man and the angels and descending uh, upon the son of man. It's kind of the, uh, the Jacob's ladder, um, mm-hmm. you know, story. Only Jesus puts himself kind of in the, in the center. He's the ladder. He's where heaven and earth mm-hmm. connects. And that's happening right now. So is, is the kingdom of God spiritual? Yes. Is the mm-hmm. kingdom of God physical? Well, yes, you and I are physical. And yet we're indwelt with, with his spirit. It works spirit its way out into right a physical now. world. It does. And, yeah. and it's, 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 a, you know, and that's bringing it just, just Jesus told us to pray, you know, that kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it is. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that the kingdom of God is both physical and spiritual. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think the kingdom of God works the way that, that many dispensationalists or even premillennialists think it does. Um, we, we tend to think of, you know, what does it mean to, to rule and to reign? Well, we have this kind of, you know, Gentile idea that ruling mm-hmm. and reigning means you make other people serve you. Brute and you force. beat them down and right. right and yep and jesus's kingdom is complete opposite how does jesus rule and reign well it's through service um right. you know one, one of the things that really just kind of blew up in my mind i don't know maybe six six or so months ago is this i you know when when dispensationalists will, will talk about you know well is jesus um is jesus ruling and reigning today well i don't see his body anywhere here in the earth well well, actually, you do. The, the physical manifestation of his reign is his body, i.e. his church on the earth. We're, we're indwelt with his spirit. We're, we're physical. We are, quote unquote, his body. You can, When you see a Christian loving and serving and giving and laying down their lives for somebody else, what are you, what are you, what are you witnessing? You are witnessing the body of Christ in action. You are witnessing yeah. the rule and reign of Jesus in and through that person who now functions as his body. And that's right. very much physical. That's not that's not just something spiritual that takes place in heaven. It's happening something right here, right now, here on this earth. And so that's where, you know, as far as as far as trying to, you know, how does how does that work with kind of the classic systems of post-millennialism and amillennialism? I don't know. Um I I you know um yeah that's where I struggle as far as, you know, a category. What, 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 what do I call myself? Why well, don't, I don't fit completely, I guess you could say with amillennialists, because I don't believe that the kingdom is only taking place in heaven. It's absolutely taking place here on earth as well. Um, you know, I, do I, do I, is this, is this the quote unquote golden age? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it, but maybe it is. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding things. Um, you know, maybe it's not how it, you know, I think it should look in my imagination, but maybe this is exactly what Christ has intended all along, um, at least up until the day, you know, where he, you know, brings the consummation of all things. So um, what I am convinced of is that the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. The kingdom of God is taking place. The kingdom of God is right now. And that when, when, whenever a person gets saved, that they are delivered from the powers of darkness and they are translated into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm going to have to use a different camera here. So it looks a little hey, bit no different, worries. but yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I totally, I agree with you on just about everything that you said there. And, and um, I don't know if you heard me kind of give you an amen or an agree on the point where you said, maybe it doesn't look exactly like I thought it was going to look. And, and that's, and that's how I now understand, you know, my, one of my, you know, tra- a part of my transition, I should say, one of the one of the shifts or the changes that that um, that I underwent during all of this was that I I looked at the kingdom 
very differently. And I think is it maybe it's possible that there might be a period of time that is the golden age in the future. And there may or may I'm not settled on that necessarily. Maybe there is, but I think oftentimes as um, another error that uh, independent fundamental Baptists will make that I made for sure was that I would um, I, I would I would read the Bible as if there's only one genre. Right, it's literal. You take everything literal, and yeah. much of the language now I realize of the kingdom is meant to be poetic. There are literary devices. God, God's work is mastery when it comes to literature. And he just does an amazing job, and it's beautiful. And we corrupt it and mess it all up, and we try to make it real black and white and literal oftentimes. And I think that that's one of the mistakes that I made. And I think a lot of the language that deals with the kingdom is meant to communicate a time of peace. Yeah, a time of obviously, you know, there's still sin. Everyone understands that during the millennial reign, there's there's sin during that. There's um, so much so that um, if you if you take the understanding of Revelation 20 as literal, when it comes to the revolt of the nations, um, where there are physical armies and so, I mean that that wouldn't give you know any issues to my position over against or anything for. You know, a, a pre mill position. So I think a lot of the passages, uh, you know, that pre millennialists would take when they would interpret <clears throat> the nature of the kingdom as, you know, uh, being very ve being very literal and physical. I think that's one of the misunderstandings that that I had in the past, and and I have a very different approach, obviously, to the Book of Revelation now that uh, that I did not take to uh, you know the Book of Revelation or eschatology generally. And time passed, and and pieces, it was piece by piece that I noticed these things, which is you know which is interesting, and I slowly saw them, and then like I mentioned, I I saw your guys' round table discussion, and um, I was I was headed down that path. I had already committed to a general judgment, and I was I was realizing that the general judgment is directly connected with the general resurrection because the resurrection and judgment happen together. But I hadn't made that commitment yet because I knew what that meant. General resurrection, the time of the rapture and all that. I knew that I would really have to move around some some end times events uh, with that. And I, I, I had already believed for, you know, um, for years that Jerusalem was Babylon. And I'll tell you what um, really gave me trouble with that was were the passages that speak to the uh, the imminent destruction of Babel of Jerusalem, I should say. You know, this generation uh, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled is quoted in Matthew twenty four, but that same language is also used when Christ identifies um, Jerusalem as their desolation is pending, and that the blood of all of the, the prophets, and even in the book of Luke, all of the apostles, they are guilty for and they're going to be judged for. So when I would highlight and cross-reference Revelation with the Gospels and Jesus' words where, he, where you, we can identify, hey, Jerusalem is Babylon. They're the ones that, are, that, that were guilty of the blood of the prophets and the apostles. There's nobody else that's an option, you know, if, if you understand what an apostle actually is. And when I would when I would do that, I would really uh, um, I'd get a lot of discomfort um, when Jesus said all of it is going to come on this generation. And then it screams, you know, in Matthew twenty four, um, the, the same language. So I was headed that way. These were things that I had already kind of acquired, and then yeah. piece by piece in the Book of Revelation, I was realizing, well, that's that's not literal. That's not literal. And it was just kind of falling slowly. And I knew where it was headed at one point. About six years ago, I kind of saw, like, where this was headed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, um, as, as you said, that's that's probably one of the one of the fatal mistakes, I think, that we make in interpreting the Bible is we, we think we know the meaning to something, and we, we don't. And this isn't, like, a new problem. Um, this is exactly what the problem that you know the generation of Jews you know during during Jesus's day this was their same problem as well they right. they had a particular understanding of the old testament of, of the prophets of this kingdom message and what it would look like and their expectations 
I, I would go as far as to say that they had the right expectations, but they they had the wrong they 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 imagined it would come about a certain way and it would look a certain way and it didn't happen the way that they imagined it. Yeah, I was gonna and, say they visualized why, it wrong. Yeah. The right. wrong application, it, it was, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. And it was and that's what it was scandalous to them. You know, a, a crucified messiah, like that's not what we thought was going to happen. We thought we were going to have a Messiah who was going to be strong and who was going to conquer and he was going to make the nations right. bow down and serve us. Like that's the Messiah that we're looking for, a crucified Messiah. That makes no sense. So it was yeah, and it, absolutely it, scandalous. It, yeah, if you don't mind if I inter interject right there, that's that's the glory yeah, of the gospel is right. like he's that much more of the strong, you know. Uh, right. I mean, uh, you know, going to the cross and defeating Satan – by bearing death and at the very same time, you know, taking the power of death away from him. I mean, what Christ did, the, the temperance, I mean, it's that much yeah. more honorable. It's, it's incredible. And, that, it and, and, and doing it, that through God's providence is just amazing. And using yeah. their rejection of him as king to make Christ king, it's amazing. It is. It is. And it just goes to show, I mean, I mean Paul talked about this in, in 1 Corinthians, right? How— yeah. How the the, the 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 cross, the the foolishness of the cross, the the message of the gospel, it's foolish to those who are wise in this you know in this world's eyes. It's foolishness right. to them. It's foolishness to the Jews. It's foolishness to the Greeks. But it's the power of God. It's the power of salvation to every, everyone who believes. And it is. It's it it just goes to show that the foolish you know the quote unquote foolishness of God is wiser than men. But but all that to go back to your point, right? It's they had a particular idea of how the scriptures were going to play out and when when it didn't play out the way that they imagined it they they actually became the enemies of god um mm -hmm. you know they they were they they were slaughtered in 70 AD um right. all of that happened and that same i see that same kind of mindset it's interesting you you know you, you said earlier toward the very beginning as far as you know why do we see premillennialism in the first couple of centuries, then we don't see it for a long time, and now we're seeing it again. Maybe it does have something to do with Israel as as a as a nation, um, mm -hmm. because that same we we have that same kind of mentality today, where people are so insistent that this is what the Bible means, and it can't mean anything else, and we're so we're a lot of times we're just very very ignorant of the language that's being used in the Bible and what it would have meant and right. you know to that contemporary generation. We're we're not familiar with the idioms. We're not familiar with the metaphors. Right. Um I, I give an example a lot of times, you know, if we want to say it's raining really hard outside, you know, we might say it's raining cats and dogs. Cats and right? dogs that's an yeah. idiom that and we don't we don't, you know, we don't think twice about that. We all know right. what that means. It means it's you know there's a torrential rainfall, but you know two thousand years from now in a culture that's far removed from ours, you know, um, and let's say they uncover some documents and it reads, you know, well, they said it rained cats and dogs, you know, it's, th there could be someone in a future time that says nope, that's what it says. It's literal. There is literal cats and dogs that fell out of the sky, right? And we would shake our heads and be like, you, you, no, you don't, you don't get it. Like that's. Yeah. That's an idiom. That's a cultural expression. I think that's a good and example. We do the same thing with the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good example, and I think it shows you're. Yeah, that's that's hitting the nail right on the head. It's it it really is embarrassing, and it shows our Western ignorance when it comes to those things. That we're a lot, right. you know, we're more unlearned than we think we are uh, scripturally. Yeah, one of the yeah. one of the, the the things that was a um, uh, 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 one of the the smaller, uh, you know. Um, the lower level interpretations that I changed in the bigger picture of Revelation, prophetically, was um, the, um, the the locusts in the book of Revelation. Those locusts, the exact description, the identical description, is found in the book of Joel, and it is. And you can you can show this. I mean, it's it's demonstrable. It's very obvious. It's very apparent that that that. This description that's being used is, in some sense, you know, just to use a broad term, poetic. It's it's uh, analogical. These are analogies. These are metaphors, and literary devices are adopted 
you know, like a hyperbole, for example, to exaggerate a point in order to get it across more effective, across more effectively. Mm -hmm. And it's a form of rhetoric, uh, you know, of uh, per uh, persuasion rhetoric in that sense. And um, when you look at, you know, Joel, that exact language, it's clear that there is an immediate application and how the Israelites would have taken it at that time, understanding that God is the captain of these locusts that are coming in that he's bringing this famine upon them and he's the one you know that it's a subsequent fam famine from the the uh, the pestilence he's in charge he's in charge of this and that they are fierce and that they aren't going to leave anything behind and that they are going to destroy all of your crops that's the the point of what's being said here and when we get to to the book of revelation it's the it's an identical description it's identical he is literally borrowing the language in order to communicate the same truth. And when we read the, through the book of Revelation, it's filled with, um, with symbolism. It's filled with signs. It's filled with uh, – it's apocalyptic literature is the, is the genre that it falls in. And we see a, a, a beast. We understand that that's symbolic, obviously. Uh, with seven heads, seven-headed monster, we see a woman that is that appears like a harlot, like a whore, and she's riding this this beast. We see a woman that's that's uh, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and uh, she has a crown that's made up of of uh, twelve stars. And I mean, scriptures just that is uh, the Book of Revelation is uh, from beginning to end uses this symbolic language, but then. One chapter next to it, we show our inconsistency of interpretation, our bad hermeneutics, in that we, you know, this chapter is literal, this one's not. This chapter is literal, this one's not. And it, it's really embarrassing. It really is. And I did it. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm just as, yeah. uh, while not understanding the language that he's borrowing, while not understanding, hey, this is taken from Joel, and this is, you know, metaphorical but language it, it, to describe how bad this famine is. But here it's literal. He uses all the exact yeah. same language, but here it's literal locus. Uh, it's silly. It shows you um, It shows you how much we, we really don't know our Old Testament. I mean, because all – you mean the, there's so many different allusions and, and whatnot to different prophetic books. I mean, you've, you've, got, you've got Ezekiel. You've, you've, you've got right. Daniel. You've got – uh, you've got Joel, you've got Micah, you've got Zechariah, you've, I mean, all yeah. of these, and, and all of those images, all of these different things that, that John has seen, it, you're right, it's borrowed imagery, much of it, from elsewhere in the Bible. And, 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 and this is where even, even as a dispensationalist, you know, I think a lot of dispensationalists, they spend, they, they don't, they have no idea, no idea what yeah, the the prophets the major prophets and the minor prophets mm. what what they're all about and the message that they're trying to communicate i'm i'm convinced of that they don't mm -hmm. understand they can go through zechariah and actually go right. through all of zechariah's strange dreams and visions and actually and actually articulate and exegete like this is what that means because it had a right. distinct meaning for for the, for those people and it's mm -hmm. it's it's uncovering that unveiling, right? Revelation, apocalypse, and right. unveiling. It's it's uncovering the meaning of those texts and how they applied to that generation. And then when we look at it in Revelation, it, it is it is it is a it. Uh, someone said Revelation is not a puzzle book, but it's a it's a picture book, and it really is. It's a, it is a That's picture good. book. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Revelation tells you that the author actually John in the prologue says he sent yeah. and he signified it by his yeah. angel unto his servant, John. Now, when you look up the term signify in Scripture, uh, the vast majority of the time means that he symboled it, right? I'm crudely yep. wording it, but he, yep. he signed it. He And what yep. what is the book filled with? And not only that, he gives you a trial run in Revelation 1. When he shows up, he, he, he kind of he conditions your mind and prepares you for what the book is going to be like. What is the genre you're going to see? And when Jesus shows up, he's got a sword coming out of his mouth, right? It's not literal. You know, he has mm -hmm. uh, he has seven stars. He's not literally holding seven stars in his right hand while standing before right. John. He has the candlestick that's present next to him. 
And then what he does for us is he interprets it immediately. So right now he has, he's laid the foundation for, hey, this is the genre. This is how ha- it's signified. This is what it looks like. Right. These things are representative. They are symbolic. And then we get in there and what does it look, you know, what do we see? That's exactly what we see repeatedly is, is symbolism. Yeah. And then, and furthermore, it's solidified by the fact that it's borrowed from passages in the Old Testament where it's symbolic in its context. Bingo. I think, um, you know, this goes back to kind of an earlier thing as, as far as um, what, what does the Bible actually say? You know, if it's the final authority for things, then, 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 you know, and I'm relating this to, to hermeneutics, you know, so I've been in churches, you've been in churches where they, they say, well, the, um, the hermeneutic that you should read or that you should use is a literal one or whatever, you know, um, Wait, wait a second. Where, where, where do you find that in, in the Bible? Right. Can you point to somewhere? And and this whole this whole bit about you know how 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 does one go about interpreting dreams and visions and apocalyptic language? Like how how does one how does one work right. with that? But the Bible actually does give us an indication of how those things work. And um, I, I remember this is one of those things that kind of you know opened my eyes a little bit. Here's the story. In Numbers, I think it's Numbers chapter 12, when um, when Miriam is trying to usurp the authority of Moses, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, so God calls uh, Miriam and Aaron to the woodshed. He calls them to come and march it right down to the front of the tabernacle, you know, like a, good, like yeah. a dad, like I, you're going to answer to me, you know. And so then God begins to commune, you know, with uh, or talk with, with Miriam and Aaron. And he goes on and he says, you know, who who is like Moses, my surface or my servant? And I'm and I'm of course paraphrasing here, but he says, yeah. you know, who I speak with, um, uh, face, to face, face to face, and 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 not in dark sayings. Apparently, all this kind of language. In other words, when God speaks to Moses, it's it's like you and I speaking. Like it, he, there's there's you know there's no question about it. Like this is what right. God is talking about. But then he goes on and he says, and I and I think this is one of those things that I think helped me as far as a hermeneutic. He says, when I speak to prophets, I speak to them in dreams and I speak mm-hmm. to them in visions and I speak to them in dark sayings and not right. apparently. In other words, and how did some of these other prophets he came? Yeah, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so so, you know, when we come to these dreams and these visions and things like that, and when we see them in particular in the Old Testament. And how how they're dealt with there, it would make sense that we would treat them similarly in the New Testament, in the right. only really New Testament apocalyptic book, um, that we would that we would read that according to its genre, and we wouldn't yeah. we wouldn't say something that we think sounds right but really isn't, which is to say we need to read it literally. Right. Yeah, that sounds good and everything like that, but again, that's tradition. I just call it out for what it is. That is tradition like show me in, show me from, in the bible where you're supposed to read that way yeah right that comes from a modern a modernized worldview even today uh, the, uh, right. and, and they are unaware of their pre, you know their their presuppositions of their worldview but you know yep. um i would even say that the the supposed hermeneutical rule to interpret the bible literally unless you can't that's oftentimes w- how it's worded right. i would say that that usurps the, the Bible's authority as being the final authority. And the reason why is because there is no rule within Scripture, as you just said a moment ago. That, I mean, you can't mm-hmm. find that as a biblical principle. Interpret the Bible literally unless you can't. That's not biblical. We have different genres. Yeah. We, have, we have poetry. We have all of these things. And, and every... Every Bible student, and I don't care it, whether we're talking a hyper dispensationalist who tend to be more literal in their interpretations, whoever it may be, everyone identifies, you know, large parts, sizable portions of Scripture, as being uh, some being literal and others being, you know, imagery, metaphorical, whatever it may be. And there's nowhere to be found in Scripture a rule that says interpret, l- interpret. Scripture, literal, unless you can't. 
<laughs> what I say as should be rule number one when it comes to our hermeneutics is um, it's you know people will refer to it oftentimes as the analogy of faith. And that is the Bible is my final authority. And what I do is I allow the Bible to interpret itself. I allow Scripture to interpret itself. And what happens when we get into Revelation 1 is it interprets itself. Christ tells you what's going to happen here, and he gives you a template in at the end of chapter number 1, and he tells you, hey, this is how this thing's going to work. Th this is how to interpret me, you know, uh, saying mm -hmm. loosely. But and, and, and what happens is just that. As we study it, of course, there are some things that are more mysterious than others, especially the the seven thunders. You know, but there there's there's a number of things that um, maybe are a little bit more difficult. But just uh, like everything in Scripture, there's there will be a beacon of light that shines in the middle of a passage that sheds light on one to two, three other verses. Once we unlock those, that becomes a beacon of light that shines light on another verse and through diligent study continued you know perseverance we can come to the truth of scripture but we allow the bible to interpret itself and i would say that interpret it literally unless you can't is a hermeneutical rule that that no one has ever used really in the christian church and that's a modernized <laughs> western yeah. idea and it's not yeah. scriptural it undermines yeah. The, uh, the, fi the, the Bible as uh, the final authority. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not consistently applied ever. You know, people, no, people give be. themselves outs and yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're exactly right. That, that's, that's a, that's a good point to kind of throw in there one more time. You're totally right, brother. It's not consistently applied because it's impossible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, and all of that too, you know, it fits into, before we ever get to a new Testament, you know, the new Testament, we have the old Testament. There, there's a right. lot of story that, that, mm -hmm. that takes place mm -hmm. before we ever get to Jesus. And even, even when we look at the, the life and the ministry of Jesus and his, his own sayings and the things that he did, um, you know, you, you look at, it, it's obvious that Jesus, um, he, he, he certainly was King. he, he certainly was a priest, but he's, he's a prophet as well. He came in the line of a prophet. He did things like a prophet. He he enacted, um, you know, a, 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 you guess you could say sign ministries like a prophet. He's he's, mm -hmm. he's 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 very consistent with the with the prophets that came before him and the things that he said and the things that he did. And he uses some of the same prophetic language. So, like. Um, I'm thinking in, you know, Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus talks about, um, you know, the sun turning to uh, turning right. black or dark and the moon turning to blood yeah. and the stars falling, falling from heaven. And and again, people people want to interpret that literally. But if we actually go back and see where that language is used in in the Old Testament. Yeah. Lo and behold. Well, what, what, what is this language used for? Well, it's used for the fall of empires. It's used for, yeah. you know, quote unquote, day of the Lords. Um, right. You know, it's the, referred the day to comes oftentimes. As a, right. A, right. A decreation language is oftentimes how uh, the title of what Bingo. that's referred to as. And it's the destruction of city states. It's the dist as you as you pointed out, it's yeah. it's um, yeah. it's I mean, that's a that's a perfect designation. Decreation language. It's it's a mm -hmm. serious cataclysmic destruction of a major, you know, empire or city state. Yeah, and we see it in the book well, of goes, Isaiah at the fall bingo. of Babylon. And and when we follow that, I mean just in, in that particular example as far as this decreation language, well why is it decreation language? And it's really cool. Like you really study yeah. this thing out. Um I mean it, it it goes to the to the the whole idea of the Jewish worldview and and creation and how God put things in order out of out of chaos, how He ordered and how He inhabited um, His His world, His creation, and so that you know the first you could say that the first sense of of, of decreation is when we get to what Noah's flood, um, and there is there is there is a decreation. It's it's amazing some of the language that's used as far as Noah's flood and even Sodom and Gomorrah. 
and how that correlates to to Genesis, you know, um, you know, one one to three, in particular Genesis one, um, a, a, as far as creation and decreation. And so it's in no wonder then when we when we see prophets speaking in their prophetic role in light of the history and in light of the worldview that that they inherit that they would use such language it's it's their it's their bread and butter it's how they see the world the only thing that's fitting for the destruction of the magnitude the judgment of god that's coming upon these these city states and empires and whatnot can only be described as a type of decreation right where 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 chaos is overwhelming the order that god has put in place you know so right We'll, yeah. we'll close here in maybe the next five to ten minutes, but one thing that we could touch on real quickly uh, that's highly significant, and, and you're you're headed towards it right now, is what took place in 70 AD. I mean, uh, it's it's un, it's so unfortunate that Christians today, from a historical perspective of knowledge in the in the first place, but obviously most most importantly as far as priority wise, would be the application scripturally of what happened and the magnitude of it, what took place in, with the Jewish wars and the desolation of the temple and the destruction that, that occurred there and why this language would be applied there. Brother Scott, what do you, what do you have to say as far as you know, 70 AD and its significance? Yeah, we, um, we, we don't we don't acknowledge it a lot of times in in modern day christianity and and even if we do acknowledge it we we um we think it's something something trivial um mm -hmm. we don't we don't see the destruction of 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 70 AD as is we don't see it as Jesus's vindication um yeah. over his enemies we um we don't we don't acknowledge just how severe and how bad it actually was. I mean, in right. in Matthew 24, well, the Olivet Discourse, Jesus talks about how, you know, I'm butchering the language, but, you know, there's not going to be another time like it. And right. people think, well, it can't, that can't have happened in the past. And, you know, they, they'll point to things like, well, what about World War II and all that, you know, right. all that kind of stuff with the Jews and stuff there. When I was teaching them through this, and when you actually read through, you know, the history of it, like like with Josephus, yeah. Josephus wasn't yeah. a Christian, right? He he didn't, he didn't right. believe in Christ, but but he was a historian, and he, I mean, it is it is unreal the amount of devastation and and suffering that came upon yeah. the Jewish people, um, untold amount of suffering. And Jesus, Jesus foretold it all, and, and it, it, it's yeah. a result of of rejection of Christ. What 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 happens when you reject Creator? You embrace chaos. You you embrace disorder. You embrace death, and that's exactly what the Jewish people did in their idolatry and their covenant unfaithfulness. They rejected the Creator God, and He warned them, and He He pleaded with them. Yeah. And and ultimately he bring judgment upon them. And that is part of that that Old Testament story of God God bringing judgment. Um yeah, even so it's, academia it's not, it's, today, there are there's yeah. there's quite a bit of scholarship that that it, that um recognizes the um uh, you know, I mean massacres I'll say of of that time with the Jewish wars and, and of course, the crucifixion of all of the Jews as being the worst massacre of the ancient world. There are a multitude of unbelieving, you know, uh, uh, scholars that would identify that, that that was the worst massacre of the ancient world. Josephus, you know, it's, been, it's become popular to, to say that he was exaggerating because the numbers don't exactly fit when it comes to world population at the time. But Josephus recorded, as I'm sure you're aware, that there were a million Jews that were crucified. Now, we know that it's yep. a fact that they did run out of wood, like he said. They cut exactly. down all of the trees where Jesus' Olivet Discourse took place. The Romans chopped down all of the trees, all of the olive trees there in order to crucify the Jews and um, because of their rebellion and their revolt and everything that happened. I mean, it was, it was uh, 
I mean, truly just that it was severe. Mm -hmm. And you made a yeah. point too about yeah. his prophecy, how Jesus prophesied about it. Another good uh, Eusebius uh, and uh, you know ch the church historian, he wrote of Jesus's foretelling about this coming destruction that would occur, and he actually used it as a proof of Christ's divinity, um, in that he you know was was able to to prophesy of this destruction, and. At, at this time, what he did was he 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 warned in order for Christians to be able to escape, and there were there's actually historical records that there were Christians that escaped in the very same way that that Christ uh, instructed them to you know get out of the city, mm -hmm. and Eusebius <clears throat> used that as a his, you know a sort of apologetic to to argue for the divinity of Christ in the the fourth century, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's 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 not something, you know, 70 AD wasn't some kind of a it wasn't some kind of a fluke. It it the, the prophets knew that this is where this thing was going. J right. John the Baptist him, himself, he I mean, I was just pulling up here, you know, Matthew chapter three. John the Baptist says in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. Uh, he'll gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That doesn't right. sound like a meek and lowly Jesus. <laughs> right. That, yeah. that, so yeah, they, even... there was this. Th Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm just saying there's this there's this expectation of of reckoning there there was there right. was a time of reckoning coming and and to not acknowledge that um you know and and I don't think by acknowledging what happened in 70 AD that that precludes a, a, of being some kind of a future reckoning some kind of a, a day of judgment when when mm -hmm. when God makes all things right and all things mm -hmm. new um, you know, the consummation of all things. I mean, there, 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 I, I think we can, or, or safe to say there's certainly a future day of reckoning, but to not acknowledge that that's what happened in 70 AD. Right. It's just, it's, it's very, it's very ignorant of the old Testament story and where the, right. where the old Testament story was going all along. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why when, when, when John the Baptist is preaching of the coming kingdom, while preaching this, and the and the Pharisees approach him, the Jews approach him. He says to them, "Who who's warned you to free to flee from the wrath to come?" So he puts yeah. those things like cheek and jowl, like right up next to one another, because at the very mm -hmm. same time, obviously, uh, that the kingdom is inaugurated is the destruction of the kingdom, you know, of the old covenant, as Hebrews twelve tells us. Says that he shook, mm -hmm. he you know he when he when he installed old, the old covenant with Israel, at that time he shook the earth, but now once more, he's shaking not only the earth but the heavens also, and then he says so that the things which are eternal, speaking of you know the kingdom of God, that it may remain, the things which are eternal will remain, and to get rid of the things that are not eternal, which is the physical temple. The very next chapter in Hebrews thirteen, he tells. The Jews, here we have no continuing city. Mm -hmm. he's, he's letting them know, you know, as he contrasts those two, they are Sinai, the old covenant, old covenant Israel, the new covenant, and the, the Jerusalem, which is above, which is free. As he contrasts the two, he says, what's going to take place here? I mean, it's, it's, it's so crucial to Christianity. I mean, it has to do with the implementation of the new covenant. And at the time of, you know, the wrath that came on the Jews at that very same time when he's doing away with the old covenant, the new covenant that had already been put in place, they were overlapping. They both existed at the same time. He's going to shake the heavens and the earth and one will remain. The eternal will remain. And the, 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 the old covenant, physical Jerusalem, will be destroyed. So at, the God, at God's wrath, is at that very same time the implementation of the new covenant, and it's amazing how that that takes place. Uh, you were kind of talking about this isn't coincidental. Um, I mean, this is obviously God's plan, and um, you see, 
it's you know you can see this providentially how this was necessary in order to move uh, new covenant Christians away from the carnal ordinances and the um, the things of old uh, when it comes to Israel's covenant and every other time that Israel was um, uh, was raided, attacked, and the, the Ark of the Covenant was taken away. They got it back. The temple was rebuilt. Um, you know, these things stayed intact, but this time it's nowhere to be seen, right? It's, it's a complete doing <clears throat> away of that old covenant in order to be able to put <clears throat> that separation between uh, the old covenant and the new covenant to firmly establish that new covenant and with it the, the kingdom of God. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Yeah, brother. Well, hey, I really appreciate you coming on, man. I I um, I enjoyed it. I learned many different things. And uh, that is that's the reason, like you were saying, these it's it's sad that these conversations can't be had more often. Uh, people are not, you know, willing to uh, uh, like it really is just tradition to question tradition or even to establish tradition so often. Um, whether it be true, right, when it's handed to them. You know, we need to make Christianity our own. We need to make our faith our own. We need to <clears throat> test it, and, um, you know, that's what I want my children to do. That's what pastors should teach uh, to their congregation. And um, yeah. that's that's what we no. need to do. And sometimes the yeah. uncomfortable truth is that when we try it and we test tradition, um, sometimes it's weak, sometimes it falls apart, and it's not biblical. Yeah. Truth is is not afraid of examination. I, I, I say that Amen. quite a bit. And it's not. Truth isn't afraid of examination. And, you know, people can have conversations like this. Um, yeah. People watching might might disagree with something I've said or something, something you've said. Um, you know, there's probably things that we're still wrestling with and just, oh, you yeah. know, trying to Absolutely. fit and figure out. We we don't have to have it all figured out, and I and I think that's where maybe Christians just need to hear that. You you don't have to have it all figured out and cinched up and and you know put a little nice bow on it and have this nice structural thing to where you think you have everything in order. You might not have everything in order, and that's that's completely okay. Um, you, your your responsibility isn't to gain knowledge although knowledge isn't a bad thing it's it's to love other believers so wrestle with these things right um try to work them out love believers put your trust in god right he's he is king he is reigning and and trust that there is there is good things to come um yeah you know and if if, if you do that you're like man you're you're off to the races like it, it can be that simple that mm -hmm. that simple um, yeah, that's a that's a perfect so, point to end on too. Christ, Christ being King, the optimism mm -hmm. in that—that's something that can't be questioned. All power yeah. is given unto me. You quoted that. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We're told that He's seated in David's throne. He's at the right hand of the Father. Ephesians one um, tells us Paul exactly. writes and says that He's seated ab above. That is every principality, power, every name that's going to be named. In not only in this world, but also that which is to come. So. Bingo, bingo, and he's reigning. He's he's reigning right now, right? Until until yeah. all enemies are under his feet. Is every, you know, is is it true that Jesus defeated death? Well, yes, but it's also true that there's still death in the world. Um, it, Jesus reigns right now. It may not look how we want it to look. There may be, there's still suffering. There's still bad things in the world. We can take consolation in knowing that suffering paradoxically is how the kingdom advances. When we don't like to suffer, no one wants to be, you know, to hear that, but, right. but take heart, you know, if, if people, if, if you're, if you're suffering out there watching this, that's how the kingdom advances. Right. Um, so trust in him. I, that's just it. Yeah, trust in him. He he he's king. He rules. He reigns. And you, you may not understand it all, and it may seem weird to you, and you may not have it all figured out, and that's okay. Just keep trusting in him and loving other people. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother Scott. I really appreciate it. Very very edifying. Yeah, brother, it's been fun. Yeah, it has been fun, man. God bless you. I'm gonna have you back on again if you're up for it. Yeah, you bet. Anytime.
All righty, man. God bless you. You have a great night. Yeah, yeah take care.